So good morning, everybody. I think it's time to start. Uh, I wish you all welcome uh, to uh, today's dissertation when Abel Gebedereda will defend his thesis with the title Characterizing and Modeling Urban Freight in Developing Economies. My name is Åke Nordberg and I'm Associate Professor here at the Department of Energy and Technology and have been appointed by the faculty to share this public defense. Uh, to fulfill the requirements of the dissertation, there is need for more actors than the respondent. And I would like to start with the opponent, which is Associate Professor Ivan Sanchez Diaz from Service Management and Logistics at Chalmers University of Technology in Gothenburg, Sweden. Uh, then we have an evaluation committee uh, with members is um, Professor Maya Kibayaniak from the Department of Strategic Management and Logistics at the Wrocław University of Economics and Business, Poland. And we have also um, Professor Dr. Asen Kinra from the Department of Economics at the University of Bremen in Germany. And uh, Associate Professor Julio C. Goes from the Department of Business and Management Science at the Norwegian School of Economics in Bergen, Norway. And we also have a reserve in the evaluation committee, which is Dr. Ciccane uh, Bosona uh, from the Department of Energy and Technology at the SLU in Uppsala. Uh, you are all warmly welcome. Uh, I also would like to present the supervisor group with the main supervisor, Professor Girma Gerbesenbet, and co-supervisor, Professor Lorenz Tavasi, uh, Dr. David Jungberg, and Dr. Claudia von Brönsa. And before going to the procedure, I'm obliged to uh, inform you that this public defense will be recorded through the webinar and will use in our dissemination activities also to archive this very special event. Right, then everybody's aware of that. So the procedure today uh, is that Abel will start with his presentation, will take approximately 30 minutes. Uh, and after that, the world will be given to the opponent, uh, who will then initiate a more detailed discussion of the scientific content of the thesis and put it to a scientific context. Uh, and when the opponent is satisfied with the questions, the word will be given to the evaluation committee to uh, follow up with further questions related to the, uh, to the thesis and highlight things you like to discuss. After that, the floor is open for questions from the audience. And thereafter, this session will be closed. However, at approximately 10.30, we will take a 10 minutes break so that you can stretch your legs, refresh yourselves. And then when we come back 10 minutes later, we will just continue from where we ended. So um, before we start, Abel, I would like to ask you, do you have anything to add in relation to your public thesis? Uh, thank you, okay. Uh, Welcome everyone. Yeah, we have uh, new updates uh, on the thesis, on the second and the third appendix, where it, 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 it was, the papers were submitted and under revision, but now both papers three and uh, two and three are published. So that's the update. Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much. Um, so. We are excited for a presentation, please. Well, welcome everyone once again. Uh, and also I would like to welcome the examination committee and the opponent and everyone attending in person and, and in online. Uh, yeah, again, my name is Abel. Uh, Today I'm going to uh, defend my thesis entitled Characterization uh, and Modeling Urban Freight 
uh, in developing economies. So this thesis work is based on four papers. So the first three are published and the last one is a uh, script. So uh, let's start with a good question. Why does the freight uh, movement in urban area really matters? So uh, yeah, we can answer this in two levels. As a resident or as an individual, we need goods to uh, consume and support our daily life. And also at the city level, we need goods for inputs to uh, uh, industries and economic activities. So, but still, this causes uh, huge problems in terms of uh, congestion, uh, noise, uh, emission, and uh, traffic accident. But the, the, the impact also, when you compare it, the impacts are disproportionate. So it causes more impact. If we take, for instance, the uh, European Union case, the trade movement only accounting for 7% of the total vehicle kilometer, but it, it causes 20% of the total congestion cost, 50% uh, of the road transport noise, 27% of the total carbon dioxide emission from road transport, and also the movement of truck is twice uh, dangerous per kilometer driven than their passenger counterpart. So in order to tackle this, we came into uh, a concept uh, of urban freight systems. So this is uh, synonymous with the urban or city logistics. Uh, mainly, uh, it aims to optimize uh, the logistics and transport activities, and also uh, it improves, uh, uh, it focuses to improve the economic efficiency and mitigate environmental externalities. But the system, uh, yeah, apart from all these objectives, but the system is inherently complex with multiple dimensions. The first one is the existence of or the presence of multiple stakeholders. Simply, we can have five stakeholders, you can see, shippers, carriers, receivers, consumers, and also the city authority. And also the existence of diverse good types and also uh, various vehicle types is also another uh, complexity to add on. And these vehicle types, they also follow intricate routing patterns in, in the cities. So apart from this, various existing trends also push uh, the, the complexity, such as high rate of urbanization and also the advent of e-commerce uh, and also the omni-channel retail. So when you see, when we extend these trends in the case of developing countries, so we have the, the urbanization is very rapid. Uh, as you can see in Asia, in Africa, the urbanization is, the rate of urbanization is very high. It, it also accompanied with fast growing economy uh, large and relatively young population, and also the impact of transport-related externality is very high. So <laughs> when we uh, try to focus more on the problems, yeah, for, for researchers like us and also the city authorities to deal with these complexities, yeah, we have lack of scientific data, knowledge and models to support the decision-making, uh, and also for the activities, we have uh, inadequate physical and organizational structure for the logistic service. Uh, the other is the logistic cost is relatively very high uh, and also have poor adaptation of best practices where, yeah, bringing best practices from other parts of the world. So it, in these problems, municipalities also, they don't know uh, what to deal with, and they just make restrictive measures uh, now and then. So if we see, if we dive uh, deep into the challenges, then we have a range of uh, different challenges. As you can see, it's categorized in, dif in different uh, ways, uh, in different labels, uh, starting from the institutional setup and their roles to the specific trade operations. So in between, we can have, uh, we, uh, we have problems related to the land use, the infrastructure, uh, the, the traffic conditions, the environmental impact, and also the, the planning and, and policy making. So yeah, in, in each category, you can find also so many specific problems that you can, uh, you can think of. 
yeah, on, on, the, on the right side. So from this, we can, from all these problems, challenges and trends, we can deduct uh, research questions. So <laughs> we deduce uh, three, uh, basically three uh, research questions. The first one is how can we select the most appropriate measures for this case, for the case of developing countries? The second one is what are the influences in determining or predicting the trade demand level? And also how we can incorporate these factors into the modeling. The other one is uh, what are the alternative ways or the alternative distribution systems uh, uh, that we can implement for the case of developing countries? Yeah, for our specific case, for our focus on the, at the scale of large cities, because the scale of the city is also another important factor. So based on these research questions, uh, our objective is to characterize and model the urban freight system using innovative approach in order to support uh, or uh, in order to uh, support an ex ante assessment of the measures in the context of developing countries. So with this, we can have, uh, yeah, we have four uh, uh, objectives. The first one is evaluate the, the context of the measures. The second one is incorporating the locational and uh, the locational effect and the logistical decisions of establishments when modeling the freight patterns and also uh, determining the operational uh, conditions. The third one is uh, evaluating the temporal stability of the, the decisions, such as the shipment size in the choice of track type. And the fourth one is assessing the potential uh, alternative distribution systems to reduce operational expenditure, environmental impact, and also uh, the logistic cost. So to answer uh, and to work on all these objectives, we follow uh, a research framework as we already identified the main challenges and gaps. The second one is we came up with a structured methods and analysis to deal with it. As you can see, we follow three steps, characterization, uh, behavioral models and impact analysis. All the four papers are well integrated under uh, this. And we have also uh, expected outputs and also the potential impacts from these studies. So for the study location, uh, the location of the study is Addis Ababa city, which is the capital of Ethiopia and also Africa as well. So it's a home to more than 5 million residents. Uh, and uh, the, the city is, it can typically represent a uh, large city in developing countries because we have high economic development uh, and also rapid urbanization or the population growth is very high and less uh, infrastructure development. So the other is, yeah, we use three different data sets uh, the 2015, 2017, and 2019 data sets. So the 2050 and 2070 are the codon-based data sets, and the 2090 data is establishment-based uh, trade surveys. So I personally uh, yeah, lead the 2050 uh, and pa participate in the planning for the 2070 data sets before my PhD. And within my PhD, we also conducted uh, the establishment-based trade survey. So these data sets, as you can see in the table, are used uh, in different uh, steps of the analysis or in different uh, aspects of the analysis, and also the detailed attributes are also given. The attributes are used in the, in the analysis from the data set. So in the models and findings, we follow uh, three basic steps, the characterization, behavioral models, and impact analysis. And the, in the behavioral models, we have two uh, types of models, the freight generation model and, and also the choice model. So I'll present both the methods and the findings all together for each steps. So in the characterization, we used a transferability framework uh, based on a systematic uh, review approach. So the main focus for this is uh, to uh, find the context, to identify the context of implemented measures, 
and also identifying the barriers and uh, the drivers in transferring these measures. So as you can see, this the, the characterization has four stages from starting from retrieving the, the articles to identifying the context and, and also the barriers uh, and the drivers. So this also uh, have a, a forward contribution to the well-established 10-step framework, the transferability framework by Macario and Marquez. So the, the results for this, uh, we retrieved a total of 325 papers. So from that, the developing countries contribute only 11. So it shows that there is less focus given on this topic in the developing world. If we see the, yeah, the more contribution belongs to the developed one and also in the emerging economy. So if we see the distribution of the topics that being discussed, the top three topics are sustainability uh, and also evaluating the performance of implemented solution. And the third one is the ways to find stakeholder participation. These three are the top, uh, top uh, topics uh, being discussed in the literature. So if we go to more into finding the context, uh, for instance, if we take uh, a solution or a topic, urban consolidation, then this topic is discussed differently in different labels and in different across the uh, uh, economic uh, classes. So in the developed economies, uh, yeah, governance, financial uh, viability, uh, and, and also stakeholder participation uh, here uh, is, is an issue. Uh, in the emerging economies, uh, is uh, you know, how to uh, allocate retailers to uh, uh, the consolidation centers. In the developing economies, is to manage how to manage even the facility is also a big question. So the context of a single uh, solution is also different in, in different cases. The other is uh, barriers and drivers. We categorize barriers into five. Uh, first is an institutional barrier, financial, physical, uh, technological, and uh, cultural barriers. So if we consider the same uh, solution topic, urban consolidation center, then the financial, uh, uh, because it needs uh, initial uh, investment and also we have, uh, yeah, needs a physical facility. So these are the most highly relevant uh, uh, barriers to consider, and also we need to have institutional capacity to manage uh, these facilities. So, in as a driver, yeah, it will uh, the, the driving force in implementing this solution is uh, it improves the freight delivery performance. So, the next step is a behavioral model, which is the freight generation, uh, freight trip generation models. So, when we say when we see when we say uh, freight generation, we're saying that this is the amount of freight attracted or produced from uh, establishment or the zonal area. So most of these uh, freight generation, trip generation models are, they have low explanatory power. It, the, the models then doesn't explain the, the, that have low predictive performance in, in predicting the, the future values. So Accounting for the inherent special aspects of these models uh, improves this predictive performance. So when we, see, when we say spatial effects, they are mani manifested in three ways. The first one is the spatial autocorrelation. So this is a systematic clustering of high values to the other high value, which we call it a positive autocorrelation. If it's uh, low values with high values, then it's a negative autocorrelation. Then otherwise, no correlation. The other is a special heterogeneity or non-stationarity. This, this shows uh, the value of a single variable can vary over a special area. The third one is the modifiable area problem. So areas, the area of analysis can be modified in different ways. So different ways of zoning the data or the, or the variables can give different results. So that problem, we call it modifiable area problem. So in recent spatial econometric studies, the, the cases of spatial autocorrelation, spatial heterogeneity, and nonlinearity 
are inseparable. So misspecifying one can lead to bias on the other. So considering all these three together, we came up with a framework uh, that has three steps. First, the preparation of data, which basically we use the establishment-based phrase survey. The second one is the verification step. We verify the data, uh, yeah, select the explanatory variables, they check the correlation, multi correlations, and also uh, yeah, deciding on uh, the functional specification of the models. Then we develop, as you can see, different models, starting from the general one, the ordinary least square, to the, the local models, which is especially out of regressive geographical regression. Then all these models uh, compared uh, at the end. When you see the results, so in the freight attraction, the spatial error model is only uh, significant in the wholesale sector. In the freight trip attraction, then the construction and then the wholesale are the significant, uh, the, they have significant spatial error. So as you can see, these spatial error models, they slightly improve uh, the model performance in terms of the adjusted R square and the IAC values. So when you come to the freight attraction model for the retail sectors, then all other models are significant, including the, the local models, the geographically weighted regression models. So as you can see, the R square values significantly improved over from the general to the local, and also the uh, AIC value of the year uh, reduces significantly. So the predictive, we, we improve the predictive performance uh, using this auto, especially auto-regressive geographically weighted regression model, which is a local regression model. The second step in the behavior analysis is the choice of shipment size and track type. So in this, uh, the track type choices are relevant uh, in the mode choice when the analysis area is uh, uh, confined to or uh, lays become uh, narrow to a city or metropolitan area or regional cases because the different vehicle types they have different loading uh, characteristics uh, they have different operational uh, characteristics and also the associated impacts from this vehicle is different on the, yeah the axle loads on on the pavements so these two decisions the, the decision of shipment size and, and the track type, they are interrelated and part of the same logistical decision. So the good question that we can ask is, are these choices are stable over time? So in order to investigate this, we use two label uh, analysis, a two-step analysis. The first one is we analyze it at the system level for all, all, overall the freight uh, system. We use integrated choice and latent variable model. In this, uh, as you can see, the, the payload is the indicator for the shipment size. And the, 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 for the utility of the trucks, the, uh, the, uti the, the truck type choice is unindicated. So the second step is at individual truck type level. Uh, so we use the latent cross model. So we have three time periods uh, and the shipment size, the intercept and slope uh, for the shipment size you can see in the yellow box uh, is analyzed with uh, uh, structural equation model yeah, using uh, the different constraints and, and also variables as you can see on the right, the factor loading, the variance and covariance and also the latent mean. So when you see the results from this, uh, the shipment size is affected by the travel distance, uh, the, the body type of the trucks, uh, and, and also whether the origin or destination uh, is a port location, and the community type, and also the sectors interacting at the end of the, the, the freight flow is also uh, a good case. But the most important case for us is to capture uh, the temporal stability is the year dummy or the binary value indicating the data collection year. So in this, uh, we have this result. Uh, so as you can see, different factors have different uh, uh, signs in their form. So when you see the distance 
when uh, larger shipment size are uh, transported over longer distances. And when the body type is a spatial body type, then they are tends to uh, uh, carry uh, smaller shipment sizes. Uh, the other is when the OD, the origin destination in the trip is a port location, then you have larger shipment sizes. The commodity type and the intersectorial flow a range of uh, these values have different uh, uh, different impacts on the shipment size. And also at the end, you have the year binary variable. You can see both the 2070 and the 2090 values are negative. It shows a decline in the shipment size from the 2050 to the 2090 at the system level. So yeah, you can see it in the graph. Yeah, you can see the, the overall shipment size trends and also the trend based on the, the, the commodity type. Here we, uh, I presented the food and beverage commodity types. But for all the cases, the shipment size drops. So now you see in the choice model, we have the, the, the utility of the trucks is affected by the, the cost, the cost, the average cost of transport uh, uh, per ton, and also the unused loading capacity of the trucks. So you see the results, as you can see, both the cost and unused uh, capacity index shows a negative value, which is conceptually right. Uh, and if we see the alternative uh, uh, specific constant using the largest truck type as a reference group, then we have uh, the only two uh, uh, large uh, truck categories, the four axle rigid uh, truck and the five axle semi-trailer trucks are the ones uh, who show who had uh, positive coefficient value. So it shows there is a preference towards uh, larger trucks. So the second step is analyzing the shipment size at the, <laughs> at the level of individual truck type. So as you can see, all truck types have uh, the shipment sizes declined for all truck types from 2050 to 2090. So, but the, the decline is very large in the largest truck categories. So this can be discussed uh, with the economic condition of our uh, location, uh, or steady location, where the economy shows a decline from the first half of uh, the, the decade between 2010 to 2020 into the second half of the decade. So there is a decline in the economy. As you can see, there is high inflation and the GDP growth is significantly dropped. So there is economic slowdown for, 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 the, for our study location. So the, the third step is the impact analysis. Uh, we, we analyze the impact of different distribution system here. As you can see, we can have a direct delivery where trucks are allowed to enter to the city center and make deliveries to a specific firm. Uh, and you have single tire distribution where you have a uh, transshipment or logistic facility at the periphery of the city and there is a change of trucks from large trucks to uh, city freighters. The third type is a two tire distribution uh, with service zones. You have another layer of local distribution center or micro hubs in, in different locations within the city and you can have, you can provide a service zones for these local, local hubs. So, yeah, this can be, yeah, you can see it in, at the scale of uh, a city. So based on these distributions, we uh, came up with four policy options. The first policy is a baseline condition where there is no restriction, uh, yeah, which is a direct delivery case. The second policy option is a single tire where there is an entry restriction for large trucks. The third one is a two-tire distribution system where uh, we allocate a specific uh, wards to a specific uh, freight facility. Uh, yeah, uh, there is also restriction here. Trucks are not allowed. So there is a change of trucks uh, for, for this case. And the policy four is similar to the policy three, which is a two-tire distribution system, but that the zoning system uses the existing administrative zoning system. So when you compare the policy alternatives, uh, as you can see, the baseline value uh, 
we fix a baseline value at 100% in all other policy options, the alternative policy options, uh, yeah, they, they, they have higher operational expenditure. When you see the pollutant emissions, uh, and also it gives more or less similar value, similar values. Uh, so <clears throat> these are the, the additional operational expenditure and also the additional pollutant emissions are the, the, the cost of restricting large trucks entering the, to the city. So when you see the, the third indicator metrics is the logistic cost. As you can see, the baseline value also has a smaller value here uh, when you compare to the other alternatives. So we have also two cases. Uh, we also introduce, uh, yeah, we use for the city freighter, we use light commercial vehicles for case one throughout. But for case two, we introduce uh, two axle track type for only the internal external movements between the facilities. So case two, uh, introduction of two axle track gives more efficiency than the logistic costs also uh, reduced. So the, the restriction of large trucks movements within the city uh, uh, gives relative advantage if we compare policy three, which is a two tire distribution system, uh, gives a relative advantage among the alternatives. So when you see the specific trip segments, uh, so these trip segments are happening inside the city boundary. So this can be a case for further innovation and also the further optimization. So uh, based on uh, this analysis, uh, yeah, we can uh, conclude that we identified a range of uh, challenges in the freight system for developing countries, uh, ranging from the uh, institutional setups to a, a specific freight operations. Uh, the other is the local spatial models, they significantly improve uh, the, the freight generation models. The third one is in the choice model, the shipment size decision uh, were temporarily uh, unstable. So this is a good case to consider because developing countries have uh, mostly they are susceptible to volatile economic conditions. The last one is, uh, yeah, we characterize uh, and model the urban freight system uh, to support decision making. Uh, so it's good to uh, characterize the system and develop uh, models. Uh, uh, yeah, because some of the policies, as you can see, are counterproductive and also it shows a need for uh, uh, doing an ex ante uh, evaluations before heading to any implementation. So, yeah, we have some recommendations for the future studies. The first one is we call for more integration of urban freight in planning cities. The other one is, yeah, uh, we look for the more into the freight intensive industry sector, so we call for yeah, more work in the non-freight intensive industries or service sectors. The other is the overloading. Uh, there is high level of overloading and also empty returns in the freight operation. So yeah, it's good to uh, uh, analyze the demand for empty trip modeling uh, using empty uh, trip modeling and tool-based uh, from models. The other is we need to uh, work more on the coordination aspect to reduce overloading and also empty returns. So the other recommendation is the vehicle related policies, uh, so which look into weight and size restrictions uh, and, and also uh, congestion pricing. Uh, and the other is replacement of uh, yeah, old vehicle, uh, old freight vehicles. And the last one is we call more studies on the transferability of uh, concepts and models to other uh, contexts uh, in different developing uh, country contexts. More, uh, it can, uh, yeah, it can 
uh, create an understanding or it can taste uh, more on the results and it can create an overall understanding uh, for different contexts. So with this, yeah, I thank you. Uh, I also like to thank uh, my PhD financer, Epinofic, and the consortium partners, SLU, TU Delft, and Addis Ababa University. So thank you all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Abel. Uh, then I would like to invite the opponents up here to the front. I will assist you with the microphone. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. And I would like to start by thanking, uh, well, Girma and uh, Annabelle. Uh, thank you for the invitation to be the opponent. And thank you for, for letting me review your thesis and, and serve as opponent. I think uh, uh, it was a very interesting read. And uh, I think I could see a lot in common to what I have been doing before. So it was very nice to, to read the thesis and see different approach and your ideas and so on. Yeah. Thank you, Ivan. And uh, well, I guess we can take a seat and <laughs> start the discussion. Yeah, OK. So yeah, I, I would like to start then with, um, with the context, because you position your paper in the context of developing countries. And uh, so that has, of course, developed countries uh, have very different problems from developing countries. And in that sense, I would like to start maybe with your experience before the, you're doing your PhD and during your PhD. So what do you think is the main challenge? Is it a problem? Why aren't we improving the freight system in developing countries? Is it a problem, an institutional problem? Is it a problem of lack of knowledge, lack of data? What do you think is the main barrier to, to really take steps towards improving urban freight systems? Yeah, uh, for this I can say that there is no silver bullet to like to hit all these uh, pieces. There are so many things that are also uh, uh, displayed here uh, with the challenge. The challenges are too many, uh, spe specifically for developing country cases. Uh, for me, the main thing, even before my PhD, I was I was doing in urban freight uh, studies. So uh, I think I remember uh, me and Girma. Uh, I also did my master study in urban freight. So like my master thesis. And uh, the thesis was like I presented to the transport authorities, and yeah, they asked me what they can advise. Like, what is your advice that we can improve? And I told them, yeah, have at least a department dealing with the problem. So they opened a department. Yeah, at the end, it pays. Uh, yeah, they, the that department is the one who lead the 2070 data collection. So at least I used it in my PhD. Yeah. So uh, and then before then they didn't have any department or any no, person they, in charge of they they don't even they know that yeah they only see the track movements and they, the the thing is they want to restrict the movement at all costs like yeah I also uh, wrote it in in the thesis that they implement this tri large tracks uh, restriction and it backfired uh, hugely backfired and uh, and then yeah they. Uh, they blink <laughs> after three months, and uh, yeah, after three months they yeah they say oh we were wrong. So this is not good as uh, when you see the public authorities when you miss this peak because it can degrade the public trust. So that's where we 
uh, yeah, we need to help them as a researcher. So because we need to give them more, uh, yeah, more insights into the problem, how they can deal with the problem. Uh, yeah, basically for me, I'm, uh, yeah, I lean more into demand management. So yeah, for in order to manage the demand and create basically more coordination, then yeah, you need to have insights what's going on in the in the system. So I think my thesis will give some some. So you think this this crisis with the with the restrictions on, on trucks that made them uh, realize that okay we need to understand better the system and and they invested more into understanding freight uh, or they stopped doing any measures on freight how how did they react to the crisis Yeah they 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 eventually they stopped the restriction uh, after that time uh, and then yeah, they were skeptical after that to take any measures. So, uh, because they don't understand, basically they, they have less uh, data, less knowledge uh, uh, to deal with it. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, you need more uh, more models, how you can predict the demand and, and also what are, how the agents work and also how you can create some kind of coordination between these agents to like, at least uh, reduce the impact in, in some way. And then if we take a, a trip to the future and now we have done all the thesis, you have done all the research, and what do you think you could tell them uh, if you had this information that you have now? What do you think you can, add, how do you think you can advise them at that point in time? How uh, have your models or your research contributed to understanding better the system so that they could make a better decision? Uh, yeah, I mean, having uh, a scientific data, uh, the concept, the knowledge and the models, it, it helps it give more insight into what's behind the curtain. You know, the, the, the freight agents, they know what they are doing, but the authorities, they don't know how to deal with the, the scale of the, the problem that's happening in the city. Uh, so, my work basically, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have a single advice for them, but uh, it's good to start uh, uh, some kind of uh, creating some kind of coordination, uh, yeah, bringing every stakeholder together and uh, have at least some discussions to move ahead. So, yeah, because you need trust. Uh, the trust is already broken. They tried. <laughs> A bad policy and the trust is already broken. Uh, so yeah, they need to uh, make a good discussion and come to a term that yeah, some kind of uh, balanced uh, things, uh, balanced measures should happen. Yeah, but there's still a, a lot, a lot, a lot to go. Okay, a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So yeah, so I want to come back to. Something that you just mentioned is, and is that now at least there is like a scientific knowledge that could support them in their decisions. And I want to come back to that point because, well, urban freight is very particular in the sense that we have different disciplines that come yeah. together, and then you can see people working from an urban planning perspective, others working uh, from a management perspective, uh, civil engineers, transportation. Yeah. So you have many different disciplines working on that, and each discipline tends to have their own view of what is science yeah. and what is the theory. We don't really have a theory in urban freight because it's kind of a new field, yeah. relatively new field. Uh, but we tend to be more empirical. And I saw that your thesis is basically about modeling and it's kind of positivist if you want to, to, to um, frame it that way. You have an approach where you say, okay, data is telling me the truth. And based on data, I can make uh, conclusions and make recommendations. Uh, so I wanted to ask you, how do you feel? So you think that's the way, like we need to have data and it's data what tells us the reality or how do you feel about that? Yeah, uh, I, I, I mean, if I, I, I take myself as a researcher. So for a researcher in this area, mostly you, yeah, we can advise more to the authorities because they are the one trying to find a balance in the system overall. Uh, so, but the companies, I mean, they they only have a profit sense, the the operators and the, the agents. So, uh, as a researcher, when we advise 
the authorities, we need to give uh, them more insight what's happening in, in the system. Because they see the track movement only. And the track movements are like, yeah, they, it's a lot of congestion, emission in the city is, is getting bad and bad every time. The noise of trucks is, is bad and all these trucks are getting old and yeah, they are not functioning well and they have lots of worries. But if we give them based on uh, data and models, scientific uh, data and, and models, uh, yeah, we give them uh, a grasp of the, the real problem and how they can at least find a, a, a balanced way of dealing with it, go, going forward uh, with it. So, yeah, my, my, my role is, uh, yeah, we have a model, and we have uh, so many points out of this data and, and the models, but they are not everything. Basically here, the idea is to assist the, the, the public sector. If, if we give them more insight, then they can sit together with the agents and they can tell them, oh, this is hap what's happening. And they have more information than the other parties. Oh, they know well. At least the, the, trust, the trust of knowing well is also is a good thing. So other researcher, it's good to bring the public authorities, which are the important elements here in, in the system or overall the city, bringing them in a good way to the table, like trace them very well and yeah, make them present their case in, in, a, in a good sense. So that's that's my, my role. So your role is somehow try to get data from companies and trucks and build a model that will help interpret that data so that they can make better decisions on, yeah. on the standard system, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and that same uh, discussion, maybe I think you mentioned a few times uh, two terms for the models. So sometimes you talk about the explanatory models and sometimes you talk about the, the forecasting or the predictive models. And, and in my head, there are two different things. Yeah. So I, I wanted to, 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 to hear as well, how do you, what do you perceive as the difference of those two types of models, the predictive models versus the explanatory models? And then maybe later we can discuss each of the models. How do you think they could be classified if explanatory? Uh, predictive, or even I would add a third one, which is the assessment models, assessment perhaps, models, right? Yeah, yeah. But how, how do you see the difference between these type of models? Yeah, the, the predictive models, uh, basically, they they give you a, a, a prediction. So you know the level of the, the freight activity uh, in ahead of ahead of time. So uh, then you can uh, prepare for the futures. The explanatories are also uh, give you which factor is affecting uh, which, and then how these factors uh, uh, come together to explain uh, whether is uh, some phenomena is happening or some activity undergoing, uh, and how you can uh, relate this to uh, into the planning and uh, in many aspects. And when we look at the models that you developed, like, let's maybe start with the models in in paper two, which okay. are on the freight generation and freight generation. That one, do you think is more of a predictive model or an explanatory model? Uh, it's, in a sense, it's uh, mostly, it's, yeah, we are trying, we're interested in uh, uh, giving more more of a predictive model, how to predict the, the freight generation, trip generation levels uh, in uh, in more accurate way. Uh, but it also, there are factors, which factor is basically if you see in, in the paper, we have many explanatory variables like the establishment, the business size, the business classifications, and also the network characteristics. Uh, yeah, all these factors, how they affect the freight patterns of the industry sectors, <coughs> uh, the retailers, the wholesalers, is, is, it, they're affected in different ways. So that's also a, a, a good case. I mean, if a retailer located in prime locations then you know they tend to attract more uh, freight and uh, more deliveries. So uh, yeah, it gives more explanatory. Uh, yeah, if if you if you are trying to uh, make land use decisions, then you can use this this kind of uh, insights from the models. Yes, I agree, and we may come back to this later. But and I, I felt that the main contribution of paper two was on the at the explanatory level. Yeah, because then. 
for predictive, like for example, how do you think the public sector could use, could use those models for prediction? Because it's hard to get the data. It's yeah. hard to. Do you think they could be applied those uh, models for prediction? Uh, they are not easy for application because the the, the the models are very detailed. But you know you need uh, <coughs> you need simple methods, simple models. Uh, yeah, to be used by the authorities, they are simple, also <coughs> practical, more practical. But also. Uh, there are uh, instances or ways that you can use also this uh, specifically uh, high accurate accuracy models to make big decisions. Uh, so, in in that sense, it, it can still be applicable. Uh, to my sense, like if you go for more accuracy, then uh, yeah, you you go for more, more of this kind. But uh, they are not simple, as you say, data, the the, the methodological aspect. And, yeah, uh, thankfully the the tools are now like open source tools can be used for this, but uh, yeah, so there is a uh, yeah uh, 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 there is a trade off. And we, we if we dive a little bit more into that specific uh, paper and and the models, but you, for example, you you mentioned that when you are located in prime locations, you should have more freight trips and more yeah. freight generation. But at the same time, you didn't find land value as a significant variable, right? Yeah, the the land value, it, uh, yeah, it's uh, basically eliminated because of the collinearity issue in the, in the model. And that was replaced, so that effect of the premium location was captured then with the spatial interaction? Interactions, yeah. And, and so that also, so something that I thought what's interesting is uh, because you have both models for freight generation, so yeah. the tonnage, the amount the of cargo that comes to, yeah. to the establishment, but also for the number of trips. Yeah. And, uh, and if I remember correctly, then you had uh, the spatial autocorrelation, for example, for retailers, if we focus on retail, yeah. then there was a spatial correlation for the freight trips, meaning that you have, when you have more establishment located together, yeah you tend to have more freight trips to that area. Yeah. But you didn't find that for the freight generation. Uh, freight trip generation. For freight trip generation, you had autocorrelation, but not uh, for freight generation. No, we have for freight generation. For freight generation as well. Yeah, yeah. The, but the freight trip generation, uh, the, the autocorrelation is not significant for our case. And, and though, so what are the implications of that? Um, uh, if you are making land use decisions, for instance. Yeah, the, the, there is a, I mean, significant interaction in uh, attracting freight for this kind of establishment. It basically is a retail establishment. So, yeah, when you make a uh, land use decision, then, yeah, uh, yeah, one case <coughs> is uh, uh, giving more, uh, yeah, allocating space for this establishment. Uh, so, because they attract more more freight but the other problem is also the, it, some of the locations can be uh, really uh, the land value can be really expensive so uh, yeah the the trend in the land value when i see uh, from the data so also uh, yes it's only some specific market locations have uh, higher land value but the others more or less follow similar trend, uh, even throughout the years. So the market locations, uh, the, the spatial decision for market locations uh, should be given more emphasis. But the others, the land value has lower effect, uh, generally, overall the, in, in, in the city. Yeah. And then if we, instead of focusing on retail now, we, we talk more about construction and manufacturing. Because I saw that for those two sectors, I'm, I'm going to talk more about the non-linearity now mm -hmm. and the coefficients that you found. So that was also something that standard, stand, stood yeah. out for me. And is that for those two sectors, you have a, a coefficient uh, that is larger than one yeah. for construction and manufacturing for employment. So it means that actually you, you have an exponential growth yeah. of uh, freight generation when you increase the employment. Yeah. 
right? And so do you think, how, how would you explain that? Is it, so I thought about it and maybe I thought that we have different, it makes sense because maybe we have within the construction sector, you could have different type of establishments, yeah. right? Maybe when you move towards very large establishments, in construction or in manufacturing, yeah. they tend to have a very different type of activity than, than smaller ones. Yeah. But I would like to hear more, what was your, your conclusion from that or why do you think you found that those results? Yeah, uh, from these specific uh, sectors, basically manufacturing, finding manufacturing in the, in the city, manufacturing plant in the large manufacturing plant, uh, you can see with the, yeah, 300, 400 employees, it's not common, uh, basically, uh, but uh, in some senses, uh, basically in the periphery of the city, you have these large manufacturing plants. And they do intensive uh, productions because you have the labor, uh, well-trained labor in, in, in the city. But the, uh, and also the, 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 the range of manufacturing, like the activities are largely diverse. Uh, yeah, it's, it's also, uh, a case when you model them, you want to put together establishments which are like uh, more or less similar, you know, like you, you, you wanna, because it, it, it gives you uh, a, a good sense of, or even if within the industry sector, then you have lots of activity. So based on the activity, uh, uh, categorizing establishment based on the activity gives more uh, clarity to, to the model values. and. Yeah, you can explain it uh, directly, but the composition for these two sectors basically is is very large. For base, uh, for manufacturing, for the construction, uh, the location of the headquarter and the site location is usually different. It mostly, I mean, almost all cases is different. So uh, even for data collection, that was a, the, the toughest thing. Yeah, you know, to choose to is it good to data from the head office because the projects are basically they have a project manager and they administer within the project so uh, yeah, we choose to go to the activity side so what this construction facility how many employees and what is uh, the, 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 the freight attractions for these facilities so we choose to go uh, more into the specific side than to the head office because the head office they can have lots of projects and they will tell you, uh, yeah, with this project, we have this, with this project, we have this. But uh, if you go to the specific side that you know, the, like even we have the, uh, we haven't used the, the uh, area, the, the, the square area where the activity took place. We haven't used it in the model, but we have the data. So we also, it's good also to uh, go to the specific side. And the range of activity also for the construction is, largely different is based on the scale of the project uh, that we have in, in the site. So, uh, yeah, the, uh, basically the, the city, uh, when it comes to the, the employment and the, the load label or the attraction label, uh, then the city is it's a fast growing city. We have lots of big, big projects going on. So, uh, and also, very uh, yeah, technologically advanced things also in the construction happening. Uh, less employment, but more uh, loads that you can see, the more scale. So uh, that's, that's why then the less employment, but more loads, like one employment uh, yeah, corresponds to more than uh, a ton of attraction per, per, per every week. Uh, the same for manufacturing. If they exist in that urban area, because have land value is very high, so we need to produce more to, to survive in, in that location. Otherwise, it's good to like close your, uh, take out the manufacturing plant into another city and sell the land. That's also another case for, for these business. So uh, they need to produce more, they need to be, uh, they need to lower their costs, including uh, number of employees, their, their overheads. So, yeah, that's that can be an explanatory uh, case for me. And, sorry, in, in that same paper, 
location and space. That that seems to be very relevant for 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 your research for that paper. Yeah. How did you uh, connect with literature in urban planning? Did you have any? Like, did you read the literature? Do you have any advice from urban planners, or, or did you at some point reflected? Okay, maybe I need some support from somebody with that expertise. Uh, yeah, basically, I have expertise in my uh, supervisor groups, uh, like well uh, experience with uh, uh, freight modeling and, and different policy issues having, and logistics activities. Uh, yeah, uh, the location and space. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, these two, like, uh, interacting features in, basically in urban areas. Where you have a good location, then space is a constraint. So when you have away from good location, then space is becoming less constrained. So this interaction exists uh, in urban areas. So even when you choose location for housing, as, as a person living, I, 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 I am a resident of the, the city, so see when you go out a little bit further uh, from the center of the city, then, then you can find more space for housing, as well, not, not only for uh, industrial activities. So there is always this interaction, and uh, yeah, for me, I, I, I try to understand this interaction even when I live in, in, in the city. That helps at least. Yes, of course. Oh. And, yeah, then I had another question more about validation because so did you try to validate these models? The uh the the trade model yeah yeah we yeah we I, I think in the earlier versions of the, the paper, uh, not the final I, I hope you read the, the earlier versions with us. Uh, we try to validate the, using the, the 2017 uh, code and data, taking some uh, area locations specifically located within the city. So, uh, yeah, but the reviewers, yeah, I mean, there is no value added in this. You can remove it. I mean, basically, you have all the models set up, so no validation is needed. Because for the validation, you need more. We basically depended on you know, for the MPT trips and, and everything, we basically uh, depend on uh, uh, the the surveys. No, we don't, we haven't modeled anything. So, yeah, even if if you don't have that model thing, yeah, it's good to remove it. So they they, they like us to remove it. We we accepted that, but we validated for some areas, and the difference in uh, in the in the values is less than around 20 in person so uh, more or less acceptable so then that means that your models could serve the two purposes that we discussed at the beginning which could be explanatory because you have been discussing a lot of yeah. of uh, what are the implications and how to connect with land use and just understanding better what is uh, at the origin or what affects uh, freight regeneration and freight generation but also it seems they could be used as, uh, as predictive because yeah. you had some validation and yeah. it's within the range of, of 25 yeah. Nice. Then if we move then to say paper three. Uh, so we saw that you had a decline in the shipping size over the years. And uh, so I'm, I'm curious if you think that's a trend only related to the economy because you, you have mentioned that. Or if you feel that there are also some logistic decisions, or or is it about the the, the fleet that the the companies are buying that is influencing that the decision? Is there a policy at the national level that is moving, to, moving towards that direction? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, yeah, the, the 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 base here is, I mean, there is no change of policy or change of vehicle type. We use consistently, we use uh, the same vehicle categories. So uh, that's what it makes it more, uh, yeah, we, we, we were con consistent throughout. So from the first at the system level and also at individual track level, we use a constant uh, track categories. Uh, so the, the thing is here, the, the shipment size decline can happen 
based on two things. One is uh, if, if you have the change in the logistics or the inventory system of the companies. So where we have like, yeah, when the transport cost drops, then the companies, they, they can have frequent deliveries in order to reduce their inventory costs. So the economic order quantity uh, can comes in uh, here for this case. We also check that the, the, the average transport cost per ton kilometer over the three times. I think it's presented in the appendix of the, the table. And the cost increases, <coughs> so that's not the case. Then. The other case, our uh, conjecture here, uh, is the shipment size decline happened it's all because of uh, the economic decline. So, yeah, I mean, the economy, uh, yeah, the trade works in the logic of the economy, so, like in the, in the competitive economy. So, the decline happens because of economic decline. I mean, for, for our case, uh, economic slowdown, we, we, we call it. So, no, it's not recession, like negative economic growth, but it's, there is a huge economic slowdown happening at the, from the first half of the decade to the second half of the decade. So that significantly uh, affected the, the freight demand, basically explained by the shipping size. Because then if you see what has happened in other countries, we also see that uh, no, basically because of new management approach, we see just in time, we see or lean management, you also see the covers, and that has led to smaller shipment size, smaller orders. And uh, maybe do you think that could be also the case in, in your data set, that the new, the new management or new inventory management practices are leading to us a decrease in the shipment size and thus a decrease in the, in the vehicle size? Uh, not really, uh, <coughs> because uh, uh, this the the, the, the management uh, and, and also the ways that you, you manage the, the system. Basically, the, in developing countries, the common thing that you see is uh, usually freight trucks are overloaded, and then when they return, they inter return empty. So the the empty return is significant, as we uh, uh, put it in the in the, in the thesis. It, it reached to like with the surveys we found that it was forty two percent in the return. So it's not it's not the case. I mean they are not changing their ways of doing this. They have, they have been doing this in the nineteen nineties and now they are doing the same. Like uh, overloading in the in the overloading case also uh, for the trucks, uh, we have waiting stations around the, the, the city gates before they come into the city. So we also investigated in other studies that 53% of the trucks entering the city are overloaded. So it's, it's quite significant, and uh, you can all, it's, it's visible also the pavement damage uh, in these uh, basically uh, intensive freight corridors. So I, I don't think the, the, the way they, they, they operate changes. Yeah, another thing that, and now moving more, I think it was on paper four, but paper three and paper four are closely connected. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that uh, that was uh, surprising in paper four is that heavy vehicles tend to be cleaner than lighter vehicles. And I think that usually it's, it's, it's not that way. Uh, so, and I think that's one of the reasons why you also have uh, less uh, CO2 emissions from, from uh, the base case than if yeah. you implement the other policy. So in general, what cities tend to do is to have toll restrictions because uh, smaller vehicles are cleaner and they generate less externalities. But in your case, it was uh, it was not the case. It was actually more that larger vehicles generate less externalities, uh, potentially because of two reasons. One is that they're more the utilization they have, yeah. they're more efficient because they can manage larger shipment size, but also because they are cleaner. So. Yeah, I'm curious how come uh, large vehicles are cleaner in, in uh, Addis Ababa than yeah, uh, For me, I want to see this problem uh, in terms of like uh, their impact uh, per ton. 
so if you see that then yeah then it it, it gives you like large vehicles uh, that is much more efficient uh, in dealing with the, the load than the, the smaller ones even if they have a lower level of uh, impact so I, I i see that in, in, in the other way so pulling out of this efficiency uh, yeah you late uh, more uh, smaller vehicles like uh, yeah one large trucks for instance uh, four axle rigid truck can be explained with another four uh, four uh, light commercial vehicles then <coughs> sending all these four into the traffic they can cause more congestion in the system so yeah uh, that also uh, leads to more impact uh, in that Yes, absolutely, and, and we agree there. But yeah, but but uh, the thing is that usually the cases that you get like from those gains in efficiency because uh, you have less impact per ton. Yeah. There's a trade-off between that and the fact that the large trucks generate more externalities. But in, in your paper, large trucks also generate less externalities because 50 percent are of of large trucks or heavy trucks are actually uh, Euro three or better. Yeah. While for the smaller vehicles, they are, it's only like 30% to 5%. 35%. So they're even cleaner. Yeah. And in that sense, then why the city wants to ban the vehicles? Is it a safety problem? Is it yeah. a yeah. congestion, like a perception of congestion then? Yeah, the, the congestion. Also, I, uh, in, in, the, in the thesis, I put uh, the congestion costing. They try to make some assessment, and they released it with a report. So there is high congestion cost happening. And the traffic accident is, uh, yeah, ma magnificently high. Uh, it's one of the city in the world with highest uh, traffic accident rate per hundred thousand rate. So they have that perception, and also the freight trucks are, uh, they, they, they are responsible in twenty percent of. The, I think if I'm if I'm correct, uh, around twenty percent of the the, the accident. Yeah, uh, yeah. If, if I'm not mistaken, so uh, there is a large uh, involvement of uh, freight vehicle in, in the accidents, uh, and also in, in some locations. Uh, the other problem I see from my side, there are also other studies in the in the noise, like the the noise impact areas. Uh, uh, basically, now the housing is like because of land constraints, they are moving <coughs> away uh, a little bit far from the city core, moving to the periphery uh, of the, the city. So, and also it, that location, they used to be location for these big manufacturing plants and construction sites and, uh, and everything. So the, the trucks movement is very high in this location. Now you have housings there also. So the noise problem is also, uh, uh, yeah, uh, there is a larger chance that are affecting these uh, new residential areas in, in this location. So the effect, uh, yeah, lots of impacts from these freight trucks, not only from congestion and uh, uh, not only from congestion. And then connecting a little bit the, the models in uh, paper three and paper four. So. I, I also, when I read, I realized that you don't really use the model for paper three to assess the policy of uh, the, or the consolidation centers in a paper four, right? You use more of the, the mean, just the, the statistics. The mean value, yeah. yeah. And why, why was that? Why couldn't you use the model you developed in, in paper three? Uh, yeah, it's, it's more of if we go for like applying the that model to the city level, then yeah, we have a lot of uh, analysis even for uh, comparing the, uh, the, the the policies. So yeah, it it, it gives uh, more dates, but uh, we cannot bring everything into one uh, one uh, paper. Uh, so like we simplify, we use a simplified approach for, for that. And yeah. so, what was the complex part to apply? From model three, so that you decided, okay, maybe the gain that we get in accuracy is not enough to to make it more complex. Uh, 
uh, yeah, the, yeah, I think uh, the policies are clearly formulated for the paper four. So it's only changing the truck types from larger to smaller. Then you have the passenger car unit also, well-established unit from the uh, capacity manual. We also use that for analyzing like uh, 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 assigning the traffic over the network. So uh, more or less the average shipment side of these trucks, uh, use of this average uh, to change the vehicle type, it, it also uh, gives uh, uh, more accurate results in my sense. Uh, but a, a full implementation of uh, different shipment size, you need more details like uh, the, yeah, the, the more knowledge into the, the shipment compositions as well. Like uh, you can have so many consigned shipments come together in one track. So when you deconsolidated it, then yeah, even if it's small, then you can uh, uh, deconsolidate it into one vehicle. The larger one can be on one vehicle because the, 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 the consignment is like a consolidation of different uh, different, uh, yeah, the laser and truck load basically. So, uh, you, you need more information for that. So, we don't have that information as well. Yeah. So, then does it mean that maybe the practicality or the utilization of model, the model in paper tree is, is, is not very practical? The model is not very practical because, yeah, you end up, you end up not using it for, for paper four. Yeah, we, we used it. We, we, we used it for yeah. the track conversions, like uh, convert, uh, uh, changing the four axle into the light commercial vehicles and how many commercial vehicles needed to transfer the shipments. That we, we directly use that. It's, it's, it's quite applicable. Yeah. Because, well, because that, I don't think that hurts at all the value of paper tree. It's just that I feel like coming back to the discussion on, on what is explanatory and what's yeah. more contributing to understanding the phenomenon, per se. Yeah. And what is more an assessment model or a predictive model? Yeah. And it feels like in paper tree, you, you focus a lot on, on explaining, on understanding yeah. what's happening. Why do we see these uh, changes in, in, the, in the fleet side and so on? But then in paper four, you, you, you felt, oh, maybe this model is, is too complex. Maybe we need a simplified version of that. Yeah. And, in, and in that sense, maybe I, I would like to hear your reflection on, on how, how do we make, like, do we need two type of models, one to understand phenomenon and a different one to assess? Or how, if you were to propose a set of models for the city to apply and assess their, their policy, would you recommend paper, uh, the models in paper two and three, or would you recommend a new simplified type of models? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, as I said before, it's, uh, it's a trade-off. If you want more accurate the implementation, which needs uh, basically uh, the capacity to implement these models, uh, yeah, uh, you can go for the the models that I have in paper two and paper three. Uh, for easy application uh, and to go forward, because the label that a city now uh, is is way even far from the simplified models. So the use of simplified models can be more practical. For, for the case, yeah, but in the future they can, like, they can go forward from the simple to complex. So start start simple, then go to the, the complex. I agree. <laughs> we need to start with simple things so that yeah. they start to use it, uh, using them, and then we can move to increase the, the level of complexity. And then if we follow that that line, then. Uh, right now you have like two separate models, but do you have in mind a way to connect the different models so that you could have a full model for the city? Yeah, we can, uh, basically we can connect. Uh, <laughs> because what we did is the, the, the shipment size uh, model and uh, the, the, the freight, freight trip generation model, they are basically is a logistic decision. So they, they can be connected. Uh, so yeah, we can connect. We, we I also try to uh, use it as a complementary uh, to see the estimates from the model three fits into the estimates from the model two 
course, we use a zonal uh, audits. Uh, after I established uh, uh, the classified traffic counts over the network, then I try to check some locations, as I mentioned in paper two. What is the, the intensity of this, the, 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 the freight traffic over the areas? So it gives uh, uh, around less than 20 percent accuracy. So I was yeah, I used uh, basically employment only models for that. It's a simple model, but uh, it gives uh, a good estimate. Okay, so it can complete that. And then actually in paper uh, four, you also have some some sort of routing model and kind of a, a, a traffic allocation model, yeah. right? But you don't focus that much on that one. Is there yeah. a reason for that? Uh, I explained it in the implementation part of that uh, that paper, so how we implement it. Like we use uh, the equilibrium model assignment and the all or nothing approach like to hit the traffic over the network. And uh, yeah, based on minimizing the, the impedance of travel time, use as a factor. So, I mentioned it, but it can also be discussed more. But the focus, you know, uh, the focus is more on uh, comparing, yeah, the, the, analyzing the impact of the, the policies. So yeah, it's just yeah, we implemented this and make it a little bit short because the important part is the impact analysis. So maybe then, do you think that in the future you could focus on on an explanatory or a more uh, a robust model for uh, traffic assignment for freight. Yeah, for for that also, uh, yeah, you need uh, more insight into the traffic, like uh, the tool-based flow models, uh, and more insight into the how to model the empty trips. Uh, that can help. I also uh, put it as uh, in the, in the recommendation. Like, yeah, that's yeah. If we can predict these two using this model, then, yeah, as you, as you said, we can go more onto these uh, uh, novel ways of uh, using uh, uh, the routing problems. Yeah. Um, then, I, yeah, there's, um, now we, we move more towards the policy itself, because paper one and po paper four are, are more policy. the policy. So, uh, yeah. Maybe you already mentioned this, but but can you repeat a little bit on on how do you see the connection between policy formulation, the performance metrics, and the models? So, do you need to sit down at the beginning and say, okay, this is the process that I'm going to follow, and this is the model, or how, how do you see is the city who should do that? Do that? Uh, should they sit together with the companies? Should they sit together with researchers? So, more in the process on. How do you think that that process of formulating a policy and the models that will uh, assess it could work? Uh, yeah, uh, as I mentioned uh, before, uh, as a researcher, our role is uh, yeah, more on to like, yeah, it's good we all like to have more, uh, I mean, here the issue is economic efficiency and less environmental problem, which improves the life quality. So this is the, the, the system target. <coughs> So in order to match the system target with a company's target, which is only profit and profit every day. So for that, uh, in order to find if our target is uh, the, on, the, on the system uh, optimal, find the system, the system optimal, then our researchers, uh, first, yeah, uh, the authorities, as they are responsible for bringing the system optimal, and they need more insight. So the researchers can assist in giving more insight and bring everyone, yeah, if they have more insight, then they can lead the conversation with all the agents. And the researcher job is to give more insight into what's behind, what's the system, how the system functions, and what can be the good intervention that everyone can benefit. So, so the researcher role is to, to me in that direction, because I also mentioned that uh, I am more of a demand management uh, person. Like uh, we should manage the demand. Uh, yeah, there are some people also focus on technologies. Technologies are good, uh, especially in uh, uh, resource management. 
uh, mobilization because, but it doesn't solve the, the root cause, the root problem, the, the, the demon. So in order to deal with the demon, then you need to know how the, the demand is in the first place, creates, and then you make the supply side also because the authorities are also, uh, they can also supply, uh, they can act in the supply side as well, like uh, supplying new infrastructure, which needs, which requires a huge investment. So, uh, yeah, the research job is uh, more or less to give the authorities a hand in leading the discussion, finding a system optimal that yeah, that the 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 business, the the private sector or the business the, that they the, they they can accept at least. Yeah, but it's, it's still uh, it's lots of stakeholder consultation uh, methods are being studied. Yeah, but still, this is a, a tough question for every city around the corner, like around the world. So, from what you said, I could also gather that there are actually two different type of approaches for the models. And one would be more the, on the long term, which no, is yeah. uh, understanding the demand and having a free demand model for the city. And that would help in, in infrastructure decisions and yeah. try to plan land use for the future and so on. But then there's a, a different type of model, which is more on, on, on the policy. Yeah. So, okay, we're going to solve this problem. And they're connected, of course, but then you need to involve the stakeholders yeah. and then yeah. uh, try to find a tailored model yeah. so that we can assess the policy. Yeah. Where do you see yourself working more in terms of research or, or applying the models? More on the long-term demand models or more on the specific short-term management issues? Uh, for me, as a, a demand modeler, uh, yeah, it's more of long-term perspective. You know? uh, because uh, the decisions associated with long-term planning are uh, maybe, as I said, uh, they can be resource-intensive like infrastructure decisions. So it's good to uh, have that kind of decision right than the, the small decisions uh, that you made uh, next month. And if it backfires, then yeah, who cares? You cancel it and, and go back to the do nothing, you know, the less is fair approach. So uh, more or less, I tend more inclined to towards the long term, but still the, 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 the yeah, the insights uh, that you can get from the, 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 the models basically it gives you more sense how even even if for the short term decisions what are the things that the model shows I mean the, all models are wrong but you know <laughs> some are useful as, as, as fam famous very important yeah so you can take that insight and yeah you can add uh, more into these uh, daily management issues but the long-term planning is also a good, uh, a good thing. But uh, yeah, so many uncertain things are also happening because of technology development and the unforeseenable the, like, uh, demands can, can also change. And, yeah, it's interesting to look forward. I, I want to, but before we go to that question, I, I want to, to ask you about, because I, I also think maybe we should discuss a little bit of what would be the role of technology and digitalization. <laughs> but maybe before moving to that, uh, I, I would like to ask you about the specific uh, policy on urban consolidation centers, because this is something that has come over and over, and we keep trying over the years, and, and they don't seem to be very stable over time. Uh, but here we are, again, testing that same concept. So if you look at your research and, and the analysis that you did, so what would be your recommendation when either uh, in Addis Ababa or in a different city, they try to implement a consolidation center. What would be your, your recommendation? What should they look at? What should they focus on before moving forward? Yeah, uh, uh, even for, uh, for the study, we only use a, a consolidation center, a transshipment uh, station. So where it's like a cross docking station where, yeah, uh, we only transfer the lots, no, no other stuff. No inventory and repacking, value adding, all, all these are, are, are not there. These are the services where the uh, consolidation centers basically can't survive, you know, value adding and uh, providing some inventory spaces for the company so that they can get more revenues in, in that ways. But we only focus on providing transshipment stations for cross-docking. 
can you remind me the your yes final what would be your, your recommendation if I did tell you okay I want to have a two tier uh, system and then we want to have some small consolidation centers in the city so that we can move to smaller towards smaller and cleaner vehicles what what would be your recommendation what should they look at when they are implementing that what did you learn from your research yeah from uh, from uh, my research uh, you need more integration between the facilities basically the facility operations, but it, it also uh, adding the facility in the system, it gives you more flexibility, especially to introduce more innovative measures, uh, for example, environmentally friendly vehicles, like electric vehicles for the final deliveries. And in some instances, you can also use cargo bikes uh, for, uh, from the micro hubs to individual locations. It gives more flexibility, but when the, the chain becomes long and you have more actors and the cost is facing and the, the agents involved, especially uh, the one who are making profit, the private sector, they, are, uh, they don't feel good, basically, in, uh, in, in so many stops and, and, and costs. And, and also that also increases the, the cost. And who is paying the cost, so they really ask. So, uh, for me, if I advise a city, then uh, uh, the city, not the, like how the companies should do, but the, from the city perspective, uh, it's hard to make infrastructure decisions. So you need to look more into, yeah, basically the, what we found in, in this study is the introduction of this uh, in, increases the operational expenditure uh, on the, and also emission. Uh, so, uh, but there is a relativity here. There is a relative advantage. Even if it increases, then there is also a relative advantage. So for now, I think, uh, yeah, you have so many problems downstream with the trucks in, in the city centers. Uh, so it's good to uh, go with uh, some, uh, uh, yeah, uh, single tire, consolidate uh, transshipment station and uh, a little bit look for which kind of trucks that you find. Uh, if you restrict only the six, uh, five and six axis semi trailers, uh, then it's a little bit ease, I think. Uh, yeah, at least, yeah, you can see yeah, from the, the bigger ones. If you restrict every of the trucks along the line, then that can be also difficult time management also. Uh, still they are trying to implement uh, with other studies. We also see how time management, like avoiding the peak hours, al allowing access to these trucks to avoid the peak hour is also, uh, it's going on, uh, yeah, very well, I guess. Uh, the assessments also shows a reduction in uh, accidents. Basically these peak hour are also the accident hours mostly and up, uh, next to the night hours so uh, yeah it's uh, it's a way of looking at so many problems and giving priorities uh, yeah. I think we will have a break but then I think what the message that uh, that I kept from that paper is that you should allow large vehicles as much as possible and then restrict them only when it's strictly necessary because they you can save emissions and you can save costs. That was the message that I kept from that paper. Is that yeah. Yeah. correct? Or? For, for me, it's a restriction of uh, the trucks. Uh, it's a panic decision that they make. Uh, I also uh, gave uh, in, the, in the problem statement that when they, whenever they panic, they just want to put some restrictive measures. So that it backfired also uh, in actual sense. So uh, and not to go in this kind of direction is a good advice for them. Like they need to see the bigger picture and at least also trying to build some trust and some kind of consensus among the agents also is another case that they, they should deal with because the trust can be easily broken. And if the, the, the business organization, if they lost their business, then yeah. It's, it's not good for the, the second time. So whenever he came up with a, a, even a good one, 
then the trust is already broken. So uh, they, they cannot trust you. So that's uh, the panic decisions always they go wrong. So, yeah. uh, that's, that's, that's for me. This trust issue is very important when you implement policies. Yeah. yeah. Yes, thank you. I, I think that if, if it fits now uh, to have a 10 minutes break. Yes, yeah, I only so have a few more questions the, left, but it may be, yes? this is a good time to, to, to do the break and then there will be more general. Yes, of course. Very good. Okay, so um, 10 minutes break. See you back at according to that from the Welcome back. <laughs> so, where were we? We were talking about then uh, the consolidation center and can you? Yeah, yeah, it's better. Yeah. Okay, then, yeah, I think I have only a few more questions. And uh, so, uh, as I said before, I think it's important also to reflect on on uh, where are we going in terms of, of uh, this digitalization trend. So there are a few things that are very trendy right now. Yeah. I think, well, we keep talking about automation, electrification, digitalization, all these three are connected. And uh, I think for in, in your case, when you're looking at models, uh, perhaps the uh, digitalization is a very important trend. Yeah. So I, I wanted to ask you, how do you see the role of digitalization uh, as compared to what you have been doing, which is mainly data from service and from companies and transactions? Yeah. So do you think digitalization will change the way we model the systems? Uh, not really. It's, it's, I, I, I see these uh, technological advancements as uh, ways of managing the resources and uh, yeah, uh, uh, and uh, yeah, giving getting more data with in, in the model. Yeah, it, now it's uh, it's hard to get data. I mean, uh, in, in, the, in the data sense, data is always also in the digitalization. Yeah, you get more data, but uh, the problem for the freight is is not only about uh, uh, the automation of the system in getting data, basically, because it's a secret of the companies uh, that they don't want to share their, their data. Uh, so what's happening in their uh, company compound, they want to keep it there. So, but uh, the automation uh, uh, and the digitalization technologies, they can they can. Uh, improve the resource management for the companies and uh, overall uh, at the system level also they, they will have an impact. Yeah, because yeah, when we will have more connected vehicles and more data, yeah. then there will be some central, that somebody will have all, all the data that we are trying to model and we create models because we lack some part of the, of the data or some part of the information, but yeah. maybe there will be then two approaches. One would be more Using statistical yeah. modeling, and then the other one would be more on data science and trying to get input from 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 the data that they have. Yeah. Uh, but then, yeah, I think there is also this issue of uh, of um, how much you can design the sample and how yeah. much you only trust on yeah. one specific part of the information or the yeah. data that you don't know how representative yeah. it is. Uh, and then, in that sense, so I, I wanted to ask you. Uh, so do you see a way to combine both or, or do you think we still will need to rely ba basically on, on service and on, on design samples? Uh, I think uh, it's good to combine them. Uh, it's good to have uh, more, uh, more data from different sources, but still the surveys, they should stand. Basically, uh, one thing that, uh, yeah, uh, I focus more on the, American data, but uh, we also did in the 2050 survey, we also did interviews. So these interviews are really, really important. You cannot get them from some centralized system. Uh, so basically, in order to understand the behavior of the decisions, you need to uh, complement the, you know, the data and the models with detailed interviews. So uh, I, I go for that, uh, basically for the surveys uh, as well. So interviews are also a good way. I think in the future I will, I'll try to manage also go more into the qualitative studies as well, complementing the, both the qualitative and the quantitative. And I think that 
just to round up, that actually connects a little bit to, to the one of the first questions I asked, which is the making the differences between the explanatory models and the predictive okay. models. And it seems that for predictive models, you could use a lot of this data that yeah. come from digitalization, yeah. but maybe Thanks. for explanatory, you will still need, as yeah. you were saying, the yeah. interviews and you need to have a design sample yeah. and service. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, so this is a more from a thing um, has to recognize me. I have just uh, more general questions. Maybe the first one is, what would you do? What you, if you had to restart, and this is kind of a cliche, a difficult question, but if you had to start over, what would you do differently? Uh, yeah, uh, this study uh, for me, it has uh, basically uh, policies, different aspects are captured here. So for me, I have a, still I have a good sense that this is a way, because there are no prior studies, I mean, uh, in this area, uh, or so even the, 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 the knowledge label, especially in, in African uh, cities, uh, regarding urban freight uh, system is very low. So for me, it's, it's a good way to uh, establish uh, uh, the, the work with, with, with this thesis. So if I start over, then, uh, yeah, as I said, I can, I can go a little more, I can uh, uh, enlarge the weeds uh, of the studies, uh, try to integrate some uh, more interview qualitative aspects, more insight into the qualitative aspects, and then uh, Put them together with with the models. So uh, yeah, and also um, to be honest, uh, uh, after I uh, we did the 2090 survey, COVID breaks out, and we are having a plan to do, to do this kind of survey. You have a model to predict that COVID was <laughs> yeah, coming, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It was unexpected. So yeah, we were having a plan to do that kind of surveys in 2020, but. Everything closed. <laughs> yeah. So, and I had another question, something that was also no, a little particular, maybe of, of your uh, papers, is the type of collaboration that you had. You yeah. have very good co authors, uh, very well known researchers yeah. co authoring your, your papers. So, what was your experience, or how, how much that collaboration enhanced your papers? Uh, a lot, uh, I can say. Uh, it's a lot. Uh, you know, when you are like a PhD student, uh, you know, sometimes you go off track. So you need someone like, no, 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 you should, you should be on track. So for that sense is good. And also uh, through the discussions, you get more insights, which things are more important to, to focus on. So I, yeah, I, I also do by myself a lot of reading, but this helps me, you know, apart from the reading someone to keep you in track and to give you, like, to discuss with you the, the most important things, uh, which, which I find is fascinating. Did you visit some of the, um, of yeah, the university yeah. where they... Yeah, yeah, I was uh, 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 vis visited uh, Professor Jose Jovain Veras in, uh, in Salo Polytechnic uh, in uh, 2021. 20, uh, so I stayed one semester there and paper three is the output from from that visit. So we formulated and then, yeah, we, we work forward until uh, its publication. And then one final question, what, what are your plans for, for the future for research and professionally? Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, personally, uh, I am passionate about the subject. Uh, so yeah, I'm looking forward to to research more on, on this area because uh, yeah this will be I mean uh, urban freight will be even more uh, problematic even more complex even in the future because there is no uh, like clear uh, and visible solutions that we, we reach so it's also a young uh, area so yeah I'm looking forward 
uh, as I'm passionate about it. I'm passionate about trade because uh, yeah, trade is a economy. And in urban area, even during my studies, more focus is given to the passenger. So yeah, I, I like uh, economics and uh, economics. So I tend to go more into the trade. So yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I, I want to continue. Please. Thank you very much. Well, for Thank the you. very nice discussion and for a very good thesis. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, thank you very much, Ivan, for a very uh, nice and boring discussion. So, uh, now I'm turning to the evaluation committee. Uh, I have this hand, hand microphone, uh, which you can use when you are asking the questions. So, um, who would like to start? <laughs> How it should be on. Thank you very much. Um, thank you also, Gilma, for inviting me for this uh, fantastic <laughs> event. And it was interesting to observe the um, discussion between you and Ivan. Some questions already were asked by Ivan. <laughs> I don't give the day. But I try to, um, uh, to, to maybe go a bit deeper into. But uh, I don't know if I should already ask all questions or just one, and, and then we have round. How you, you, can, uh, you can ask a couple of questions. Yeah, and then one we'll question, OK. So um, uh, Abel, it was a pleasure to uh, read uh, your thesis and, and papers. And I have a few questions. And maybe I start with some, uh, I think, simple one, which will clarify some meanings. Because you use, I would say, like a, um, uh, interchangeably uh, three words like uh, actors, stakeholders, and agents. Yeah. Could you please uh, briefly describe how do you understand these three meanings? Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I use them interchangeably. There is a subtle difference between all these three. Uh, actors uh, is in the activities, uh, agents in the decisions, and stakeholders, I think. Uh, in a bigger picture. That's my understanding. Yeah, I think that uh, uh, in the paper for Valentine's, there is a difference between actors and stakeholders, when yeah. she also focused that actors are those who are involved in some activities yeah. uh, directly, and stakeholders uh, are those who are also Correct. indirectly. Yeah. In the, the same, yeah. the um, okay, so um, so just maybe one more, because it was like the clarifying, and then I will pass. <laughs> Uh, I was curious about the engagement of stakeholders, uh, and uh, yes, there were many discussions about the policy. And uh, actually, I wanted to ask you how, uh, what would be your suggestion or recommendation how to engage stakeholders uh, for the collaboration? Yes, because we need the collaboration uh, for urban freight transport. But maybe I will ask you directly: What do you think about the uh, introduction of uh, trade quality partnership? in the city, in Addis Ababa. Do you think there's a chance for introducing this kind of uh, solutions? And who should be the coordinator of this initiative? Uh, yeah, I think there are a couple of uh, startups of this kind of engagements. Uh, but uh, as, I, uh, yeah, as I previously mentioned, the authorities, they, they, they don't have uh, the knowledge even how to lead this kind of discussions. So uh, hopefully they, they, they should be the lead because uh, yeah, they are the one uh, sh should be in charge of facilitating this kind of partnership. So, and also they have the tool in their hand, all the policy tools are in the hands of authorities. So uh, yeah, they can do regulations basically, they can do the uh, penalties and all the incentives, the subsidies uh, and everything. So. Uh, they are the one who should lead, and uh, the, there are startups. But the the problem with the startups is not the the the, the other stakeholders. This is from the authorities because they don't know how to deal with this, uh, yeah, how to go forward with these kind of uh, partnerships. Yeah, we need a trade quality partnership. It's not kind of formal. Uh, yeah. Organization, it's more informal, and I think that also you, as a representative of university or your university, can be the coordinator. And I think it's good for you to also look to the work of Michael, Professor Michael Brown, who was, I think, 
uh, one of the initiator, maybe and the popularizer of the trade quality partnership. So okay. I, I hope that you can introduce this kind of uh, solutions yeah. in your city. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Shall I? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, again, thank you for this thesis. I think it, it is a very interesting thesis. I'm kind of an outsider here. I'm not a, a modeler. I am a logistics person. Okay. Uh, but I think uh, it was uh, interesting to read. And, and for that, it's, it's good to have a thesis that actually keeps you <laughs> interested in that. I, I, I think I don't have many questions about the models. Uh, you have discussed in the papers, I think. But I still have something. And again, uh, I, this is more than like a discussion. Part. Yeah. And I come from me being a logistics person. So when I was reading the, the, the results, you had this uh, thing with consolidation. So yeah. your policies are, in a way, very simple. There is a ban coming from. <clears throat> yeah. And, and, and what is interesting is to see the impact that you have. So you had this consolidation and immediately you also reflected, well, increasing in the cost, I, yeah. I can understand, but also increasing in, in, in the externalities. Yeah. So what I want to know is how is that handled when they did the consolidation? So, so how you answer earlier yeah. when you had the discussion with her, even. Yeah. She said it's very simple. And, and the reason I'm asking this question is I'm an optimization person. And if you tell me that you're going to consolidate, it's hard to believe for me when you consolidate, you don't do something to do better from that point forward. Yeah. And if I optimize, I can tell you, you can reduce the distance driven, yeah. and then that could have an impact on pollution, and also it could reduce some of the externalities. One of the problems that I've, I've, I've seen in the literature with consolidation centers is the business models usually yeah. become yeah. a problem. Yeah. Because they are not profitable for the, the, the freight deliverers, yeah. and usually requires incentives from the city. Yeah. So, so it was kind of uh, shocking to me when I saw it. So, could you explain a little bit how is that handled? Do you see then the, the potential of having a logistics person looking at these and advising that would change the picture a bit? Do you think or? that not have any impact whatsoever? Uh, yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a good question. <clears throat> Basically, the overall, the, even my work falls into like freight transport and logistics, like uh, trying to uh, bring them closer. That's, that's my sense with all the work. Uh, optimization, of course, uh, I also uh, at, at the final uh, slide of the impact analysis, I put it like that. Ah, this is happening inside the city territory and it's open for uh, further innovation and optimization. So that, that can be uh, a way to start from, you know, you know the, the level of the operational expenditure there, the emissions and logistic cost that's happening within the city territory. Then, yeah, you can optimize it uh, and and uh, you can uh, you can do a lot of other things starting from that. So uh, if you ask me uh, if you ask me uh, what a logistics person can do in this scenario, uh, yeah, the the facility operations, uh, yeah, you know, in the in the in the paper one when I was presenting about the, the uh, consolidation center, still the focus in developing country is how to manage the facilities you know it's not about like how to make them feasible uh, financially feasible uh, and also how to engage stakeholders and the government system no it's it's a management so logistics person is needed in in that case also for, uh, for that uh, so then a logistics person can help uh, uh, yeah in uh, in trying to, uh, one, managing the operations very well uh, there, and also uh, optimizing the, the, the routes between the facilities. For the two-tire distribution, we have also the local uh, hubs, the micro hubs. So, yeah, 
the, the, the route between these uh, two uh, facilities can be optimized. So, so yeah. basically, if I understand it correctly, in your data, you, you have something where the decision was made, and when that decision was made in the band, there was nothing done after that yeah. decision to improve the operation coming from that consolidation point, or that band. Uh, because there's a transshipment, yeah. basically. They have these big trucks, they come, they do the transshipment, the smaller yeah. trucks, and then off you go. Yeah. But uh, it's, it's not optimized, in my understanding. It's, yeah. uh, or something is wrong. <laughs> yeah. But, but uh, one I thing mean, that I... So, so, so yeah. that's my feeling, but I want to understand. Yeah, yeah. One thing that I haven't mentioned also is uh, uh, tracking is, you know, the only option to for the city. Uh, there is no other alternating mode. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, in a way, if you ban large trucks, then the smaller trucks, the city freighter has to take over. So that's what we uh, we, we take into consideration uh, in here. But still, it can be optimized. Our uh, implementation is also in optimized environment where we optimize the travel time in patents over the network. But it's in interaction with all the other vehicle categories, not only the, the freights. So the lower cost of the network is calculated to assign the, the track movements over the over the network. Okay. So yeah, I think that part is also with uh, when I discuss with Ivan, we mentioned it in, in a small way, but it can be expanded as well. Okay. Because then it comes to the, the, the other parts. So, so you mentioned in your future work, so collaboration. Yeah. Okay. So so uh, what do you? C is, is collaboration. And then I, I have a follow-up question because I, I have a view of collaboration also. Collaboration between yeah. stakeholders. So so basically I I can tell you right away. So again as a logistics, there is quite a lot of research on this collaboration. Yeah. Okay, and then you could see that collaboration between the shippers or the freight transportation could lead to improvements, both on emissions, time, yeah. and, 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 and distance. Yeah. Okay, so one of the problems with collaboration is even if you can actually show that there is potential to realize savings in all the different uh, aspects, uh, one of the challenges is the business model. Yeah. So how you distribute the savings is not a trivial yeah. question. Because well, one of the pay deliver uh, companies say, "Well, I'm saving you a lot of money, so you should give me mm -hmm. a piece of that share." Mm -hmm. And then the other one comes and says, "Well, but I have saved." Me. So the question is, "Well, who belongs to what?" Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then you were mentioning, "Well, the authorities have all this power there. Do, do you have any ideas as to if the role of the authorities could make this viable or or?" or uh, in, in the, I mean, they can uh, they can support it in the short term, but it has to save its life for long term. So there should be some good business case for survival uh, in this uh, in this facility. So that's also a, a problem why the consolidation centers are falling uh, yeah falling out everywhere. So the authorities they can do the short term. They can subsidize it and they can uh, bring everyone, but everyone has to see the benefits so that they can engage more and and also the revenue systems can also be made in this actor. So the like the value addition, the inventory and everything has to uh, more services can be introduced in the facilities to get to generate more revenue and to sustain in the, in the long term. Yeah, yeah. So I got curious because you mentioned that well, the authorities have all these roles to play there. So I got uh, curious as to what ideas you have. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So thank you for a very nice uh, talk, and uh, I've been looking forward to your defense and. Uh,
I think uh, what strikes me really is uh, the developing country context because I originate in one two uh, yeah. or something that yeah. is called the developing country problem. And then you bring in the aspect of modeling. Uh, so, so model is an abstraction of reality. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why you probably say that all models are shared. And, uh, and you probably even, I think the starting point of assumption is that life is very complex. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, and then you want to create a model and not just one model, but two models, yeah. which your opponent wants you to connect and yeah. make sense of. Yeah. And a third model also on the way. And I was thinking, I mean, now you have done this for so many years in yeah. the Ethiopian context. And, uh, and I was thinking, what do you think is your fundamental contribution to science in terms of modeling? Uh, Reducing the complexity or increasing the complexity, or how do you see this? <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, the contribution to science. Uh, I think the for me the uh, first is we uh, we solidify the, the concept to understand for for that specific context. Uh, second, the models are novel by themselves. Like uh, yeah. Uh, basically, if we see the the fifth generation, fifth generation models, uh, we extend that the, the locational and spatial determinants in the model to incorporating more local models and improve the predictive performance of the model significantly. Uh, that's uh, that's a big way. The other is in, in the in the uh, choice of track type models. Uh, I think nobody has seen the problem in the, the choice of shipping size in this way, in the like finding the temporal stability, because it's also really important for developing countries because developing countries are they have volatile economic conditions, they, they are susceptible to economic fluctuations. So looking into the this uh, preference of shipment size in this way uh, is, is very important. So I think we are the first one to look the the achievement I choice in, in the, its temporal uh, dimension. So just as a follow up, uh, if this is a fundamental contribution, so then data is probably also an important aspect related to the model. Yeah. And what do you think about that uh, in the developing country context? Because data is not stable, uh, yeah. so. To what extent is this implementable in the long run or in the medium term? Um, so I would have expected you to also talk a little bit more about the specific context of Ethiopia and yeah. is it different from other places or, you know, or how does it work? Uh, because the data, the model is as good as the data. Is what yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think it's two questions uh, together. So the first one is about the data. So uh, basically, data are, you know, is scarce and uh, hard to find also because some of the data are part of a decision by a business entity, so they don't want to share uh, their that decision. You know, uh, even some of the businesses, especially the mid and the small businesses, when we survey for freight. And they ask us, oh, are you from tax authority? No, we are from the university. <laughs> they don't want it because they, they feel that if we give them their like outputs, how, how much the load they, they, they can uh, receive and they can produce, then they are, they, it can be goes to the tax authorities and they are not like obliged to keep bookings for making taxes. They, 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 they throw tax on the small businesses as they like, they see the activity and then they, yeah, you pay this much. So whenever they have like bigger loads and the uh, bigger outputs, then the tax authorities increases the tax on them. So they, they are really, uh, they are not okay in, in giving away this data during our interview. Uh, and the response rate is very low, very low because of this, mainly this reason. Uh, 
marketing. The other reason is the understanding of why the university is serving uh, retail establishment. So they, 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 they haven't come across with this kind of service uh, before. So that's also the case for the data. It's always uh, hard to find data. Uh, what was the second question? Yeah, it's pretty much in the African context. Context, the yeah. European context, yeah. uh, specifically. Is this more of a problem in Ethiopia as in other places, for instance? Uh, uh, the, the models or the... Yeah, yeah the data uh, and the trust in data. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, even for the national level also, even yeah, when you do a roadside interview of trucks, they are very skeptical uh, as you are going to like make restrictive measures because there was restri restrictive measures with backfire. Or well, you are studying next time to restrict our entry to the city. So they, they are also even the, the truck drivers who are doing the national uh, the routes, they, they are also skeptical in giving theirs. Uh, the other thing about artists as a, as a context uh, you, you mentioned, uh, yeah, we take Addis uh, as a typical city. Uh, in developing cities, large cities, Addis is 5 million, which is a large city. And we for, there is a forecast that uh, Addis will be a mega city in the, like 2035 or 2040. The population increase and, and then it will join uh, 10 million. Uh, the, the typical thing is there is a, fast urbanization, so the population growth is very high. The economic development is the fastest growing city in the continent. But the infrastructure, when you see the infrastructure development, is, is, is not, uh, yeah, it's, it lags behind, well behind. So it's a typical case for the, the cities in developing countries. So, that's... so maybe I can have, can I have a quote? Yeah. So, so it, there is a problem in terms of trust, as you have mentioned many times. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, in how trucks are perceived uh, as yeah. villains uh, yeah. coming into the city and destroying yeah. the or make, making congestion a problem, but also how the how the actors and the agents perceive as the stakeholders and the other policy makers in terms of restrictive practices and so do you uh, I was wondering because when you look at the barriers uh, in the paper one or at least I understood there was something like um, a lot of physical barriers were found to be relevant yeah. but when we look at culture and technology and later on when you also say they were not considered so relevant yeah and uh, and I'm just wondering how and why, when there are all these problems, uh, and this is something to do with the, an institution and a norm which has developed over many, many years, uh, how can this not be a problem? And why does this not figure out then in your modeling? Uh, the cultural barrier? Yeah. Uh, for uh, specific, specific to the paper one, uh, we see the transferability practice from developed to developing countries. And uh, yeah, we were uh, uh, rating the relevance, whether culture can be a barrier in the transfer. Because, uh, you know, one example is, uh, yeah, if you transfer off our delivery or night delivery, the culture can be a barrier. There are other barriers, of course. Uh, working night shifters, they are not common in Ethiopia. So uh, that can be a barrier for that case. But mostly for the others, they can be transferable and uh, there is no cultural uh, collusion uh, that can happen when you transfer. That's why like, it's not relevant for us to focus on, 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 on that. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, after, I would like to come back to your, to your results that uh, the, the big large trucks uh, uh, are more effective and uh, less pollutant. 
I remember my uh, uh, interview with one of the representatives of local authority in Berlin, because a few years ago I also introduced, conducted some research among uh, European capital cities. And uh, I remember that in Berlin that time, there was no restrictions for big trucks. And uh, mm, this person thought we, this is because we prefer to have one big truck with full, uh, uh, in, uh, with, uh, full, full capacity, because it's less uh, pollutant, it's, uh, it's better. At the same time, I remember uh, a few years ago when I went to Australia, to Melbourne, and I was uh, really surprised how noisy it's in the city because of the uh, big trucks which were unable to go to the city and to, to travel. And my question is, uh, because you um, focus on uh, emissions of CO2, NOx, but you didn't include noise. Do you think that if you include the impact on noise, because it's also quite of important uh, aspects of the environmental degradation, uh, it, the results could change? This is my question one. And the second one, it's uh, you also mentioned about the uh, freight uh, that freight vehicles are involved in 12 percentage of tra traffic accidents, and I think that safety is also a very important issue for uh, urban freight transport. And do you think that in the future you could also include or measure the impact of these models on safety? So, this yeah. is like, so first of all, noise, it would change. And the secondly, if these models could include also the uh, safety or, or to, you, could, you were able to measure the impact of safety of these various scenarios, okay? Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, for the noise case, <clears throat> yeah, as I mentioned, the night activity is low. I mean, the noise uh, impact is more magnified during the night time. So the activity in the night time is low. So uh, the noise impact, uh, yeah, now is coming because the housing is like migrating to the periphery of the city and the more truck activity is there in the periphery. So it's, yeah, I mean, noise is very relevant. Uh, it's getting more relevant uh, uh, every day and the trucks are aging uh, well. So they, they are releasing more noise. Uh, for the safety, I think, uh, safety is uh, the main concern for the city because fatality is very high. Uh, the involvement of freight trucks uh, is very high. If they involve, then the fatali fatality is also increased uh, significantly because they are like the size and the, and every other aspects. So uh, yeah, we can include the safety aspect, but the problem is yeah we, uh, we need more data. <laughs> So that's always the case. So if we have more data, then we can add more variables and uh, uh, yeah, uh, explain the, the scenario in, in a big picture. So still, I, I feel both, both cases are relevant. You can say all about data, yes? Yeah. I think it's the problem not only <laughs> yeah, yeah. in the, the, the city analyzed. Yeah. Uh, it's the same in Europe, I think, it's, that it's not so easy to collect data. Uh, but I think uh, it may change the, the results, uh, especially that left track uh, are especially dangerous regarding yeah. uh, accidents. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So yeah. uh, I want to come back to these uh, uh, fundamental or the contribution of your thesis, and then I, I, I'm going to hold you accountable for what you write. Okay. okay so. You write, the resulting framework can support informed decision interventions that suit the practical reality of urban freight systems and their local conditions. Yeah. But one of the things I have struggled, and based on the discussion of it, is to identify the cohesion of this framework. So you have these four papers. Yeah. You have these four models. If we go back to the discussion, you have the even uh, here at some yeah. point said, well, you have this model in paper three. Then late in paper four, it's not clear how you use them. And, and then uh, now uh, coming back to the previous question, also the, the, the elements we identify in paper one, somehow they don't show up clearly in, in, in some of the models. And then I myself, I have a struggle with what is the framework? What is the, this cohesive thing that is the result of your thesis that allows people to take uh, or to make decisions, informed decisions, as, as you can see, say here. Could you explain it 
a few words. And yeah, yeah, I, sure, I can. Uh, if you see the, yeah, the problems are like multidimensional and uh, the, the system is also uh, quite complex. So uh, with the, the concepts of the, we characterize, we give the, 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 the sense of a grasp that what are the things that exist in developing countries because the studies are, are, are as I showed in, we retrieved from databases 325 studies and the, the focus for developing countries, the contribution is very minimal. So still, they don't have that focus in this in this in this aspect. So then we uh, enrich uh, the the knowledge base there, uh, giving more context, and then with the models, uh, we provided uh, different uh, outputs like that can be used by the, 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 the that can be used for policy analysis. I mean. If you take, for instance, we did a last city analysis for the choice of track types, and which track is, which track category is susceptible to the changing cost, and which track is susceptible if you change the axle load limitations. So this is the result of the model. So if they go for that, uh, this track type is affected by this. Then the models, they sh they, they show you, uh, they, they, they showed uh, so many, uh, uh, so many things that you can take away from, from it, basically simply the same, based on locations and the operations of the, the trucks and the, the loading labels, uh, the cost that I, as I mentioned, and also the, even the, the, the discussion with the economy. So uh, a lot more things to, to take on. And also the, the simplest decision they made is can be wrong also, like it can be counterproductive as well, when they make decisions, like restricting trucks, it can be counterproductive. So that can be also a single most important advice that can be really supported by analysis, because it, it backfired. So, so let, let me <laughs> perhaps refine the question. I come from Colombia, and I relate to some of these yeah. issues that you have described. So now I'm the government of a city in Colombia, and I say, well, I got interested. How would you describe it? If I come to you and I want your advice, please explain to me how would this go along? So I have a new city. You have your framework. How would you proceed? Uh, yeah, as I say, there's, there is no silver bullet to, to hit everything through. Uh, yeah, yeah, all, that, all that will be, that will <laughs> yeah, be. But then yeah. the, the, the thesis propose a framework. Yeah. And that framework is a methodology. Yeah. Then, as a methodology, I understand this is something that I can take, extrapolate, and use. Yeah. Okay. So, if I am the mayor of that city and I come to you and I say, well, like, I want to use this framework, how would you advise? Would they proceed based on this framework that is the output? Yes, you are research? asking the, the top advice. That I can give. No, no, I'm not. A, I, the, the advice comes after they apply the framework. Yeah, okay. because this is why I understand the, the frameworks. Yeah. The framework is a methodology. Yeah. And of course, that methodology applied to a case would result yeah. in insights that provide a basis for making decisions. And that's why you state. Okay? Yeah. So now I'm saying I'm this mayor of this new city. And I come to you. And I say, well, this guy has this framework that allows me to make these decisions and city plan. Yeah. How would you explain that framework to that mayor and say, well, this is how this framework proceeds? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, for uh, as a framework, then it's good to look more into ways of managing demand, uh, basically. All the models give you ways how you can manage the demand. In that management, you can have land use decisions, uh, operational decisions, uh, and also investment decisions for uh, vehicle related, or it can be uh, uh, infrastructure related. So all these frameworks are there. So uh, yeah, it's for me is more on to like how the, you can manage the demand in relation to land use. So what are the land use factors here? We found that. Uh, retailers, if they located 
uh, uh, near to the primary network, then they, they tend to attract more freight. So uh, then, yeah, uh, what can the, the, the land use uh, should be look like in relation to these industrial uh, industry sectors? Then you go uh, deep into, like, you, you can apply the model outputs into specific cases. Then you can uh, you can incorporate more uh, more of the freight demand management into the plan. So uh, the reason I'm interested in this framework point is because I think this is very valuable. Then all these cities are developing. So now uh, one of the things that caught my attention when I was doing this is this transferability. Okay. So you have the developed cities. What we, what we can use from there to, to apply here. So now I come back to the consolidation centers. Oh, okay. uh, well, I, just... I, was, I was sorry. I was thinking that uh, you say you are mayor in Colombia. So it's, uh, I, I saw it like a, a specific case for a city that I did. And yeah, yeah, I, yeah. But that, I... that, okay. then let's move forward. <laughs> okay. So one of the things that I, I feel is important to clarify this framework and that I leave it for you. Yeah. So I'm not gonna is uh, this issue. So you have this transferability, you have developed cities, uh, developed countries as you call them, and, and then they have made some decisions on how. So now in your thesis you have this consolidation center and one of the things that is clear, at least from what I've learned from the leads is consolidation centers, they don't work. Basically core of the problem is business models. Yeah. Okay. Once you start with them, you have subsidies. They are wonderful. Once they have to pay for it, they don't work because they don't want to pay for it. Yeah. But then that doesn't allow to realize the benefits. And if I tell you from optimization point of view, you do have benefits because you can improve the routing and the fishing space. And all the things have not worked yeah. in the developed uh, countries. Now you talk about this transferability, you mentioned these things, and then you were at, in your thesis, you say, well, the developing countries are focusing on how this could actually uh, be work. And yeah. my question, after a long <laughs> speech is, one of the things that concerns me is that we have this idea that we have to follow after the developed countries. Is there a way to use innovation to bypass those mistakes? or to use this knowledge that you have discovered from developing countries to actually develop them. Of course, we also use the lessons from, yeah. from, from previous experience to develop them on their own, on, on their own characteristics and their things, not following the path of necessary transfer. And I point to the consolidation centers because they don't work. Yeah. They haven't worked. I mean, I, I still, I'm interested in them, but experience now is that they fail. So what, how, what do you think about this? Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, even with nothing, this failure is something. <laughs> Before you, yeah, I mean, we need to have a logistic facility, but it, yeah, you will be more, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, you you think twice at least because you have an exp bad experience failing in, in developed countries. So, uh, way of following uh, developed country for developing countries uh, is because a lot of things are tried already. So you, it's good to adopt the best practice that can function, you know, and it, 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 leap, it leapfrog you onto the, to the, to the good way. But the problem is the institutional capacity, you know, to initiate this and implement it and, and also managing to the to the future, so that, that's the problem I see. But uh, it's good to to make transferability for developing countries because, yeah, you, yeah, you know the wise uh, person learn from mistake of others. So it's good to learn from the mistake and the success of the others. So that's how I see it. Yeah. Uh, hello, Jose. Uh, I have a clarification question uh, that arose. Uh, freight generation and freight trip generation. Do you use these terms interchangeably? No, no. no. Okay. Uh, they are completely, uh, they are at the, in the model, they are at the generation step, but they 
they measure different things and they, their implication is also different. Okay. Uh, sure. Okay. Just wanted to clarify that because one relates more to the production yeah, side production, and, the, yeah. and the production cost, where yeah. the other one is more computation. Log logistics. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because there was a comment from the opponent about you saw some trends as the economic yeah. going down, yeah. um, the economic conditions leading to the fall in shipment size. Yeah. yeah. So that's why I was wondering, but that has nothing to do with, you don't use them interchangeably inside the, no, okay, sure. <coughs> then I have a question again, uh, coming back to the broad, uh, so more like the, we talked about, you talk about location a lot, and in and, and space, yeah. and then you also find that the, 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 in your findings, it is, uh, these are highly relevant things to discuss, uh, but you do not talk about the aspect of place in location so much, more like space. And do you see a difference between space and place uh, and the types of costs this generates yeah. on trips? And, uh, and could that have had an impact? Uh, yeah. Uh, do, you, do you mean place as a location or? Uh, place as a characteristic of the location. The, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, uh, I think the, the characteristics in the, in, the, in the modeling is hard to like, like prove the characteristics of a location directly, but you use uh, proxy variables, like uh, we use uh, straight weights as, as a proxy, like uh, yeah, when the straight waves is getting larger, then then the, the that location is should be important, and also the nearness to the primary road network is also a proxy indicating the the, the importance of the place. So that's how the, we we captured it with the proxy variables, not like directly put the importance of the place uh, in, in in the model. And are these proxy variables doing justice to the reality in the uh, in the uh, above context? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. We we uh, in the in the in the discussion part of paper too, uh, we discussed these proxy variables in relation to even the prior studies and uh, how in the, with the setup of the city. Uh, I have, I think, a uh, general question. You focus in your uh, thesis on developing economies, um, especially in, in, in Ethiopia. Uh, and uh, my question is, uh, do you think that uh, models which you uh, develop uh, are universal and can be applied in all developing countries? And uh, do you think that these models could be also applied in developed countries? Yeah. If not, uh, would you change something for the, these developed countries or not? Uh, yeah, you're right. <clears throat> they are applicable. Uh, basically, these are novel methods, uh, novel models, both uh, the, the, the generation uh, model and also the choice model. They are novel models uh, by themselves. It's uh, a way of looking at the problem in a novel way. So it, it, anyone can, can use. Uh, we, uh, our advancement is the methodological advancement in, 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 this, in these models. Basically. Do you think it would change something in the models if you conduct them for developing countries? Developed countries, yes, or developed countries? Uh, not really. They, you, you, you can still try to use it uh, as it is, you know, using the same variables. And uh, I think Ivan also did some of the things in the models in the third generation. and. The, the choice models also have been tried, but we look uh, more into the advancement in that in that direction. So it can be applicable. Okay. Uh, well, this is uh, a, a quite interesting discussion. So uh, coming back to something you were discussing with you, uh, new technologies. Yeah. Okay. So how they could uh, enhance it. So, your position seemed to be like, well, they are not going to introduce uh, new data, more or less, because. Yeah. So, so don't you think that new technologies could be an enabler or also rethink the city and the solutions that they can 
implement and uh, for example overcome these difficulties that developed countries have encountered these solutions uh, because I, I felt that you were a little bit reactive <laughs> when you were having this discussion yeah, even, yeah. so I, I would like to hear a little bit more about that yeah uh, for me as a person uh, I like tech you know, the digitization, automation, the advancement. I, I really appreciate I'm way into that. When it comes to freight, also their purpose is mainly, as you said, uh, they can help you on the resource management and implementation of uh, complex uh, policies in, in a good way. It helps, it assists us. Uh, but the, the, the root problem in freight is a demand. So they, they cannot solve the root, the root problem. Yeah. So, so let me... When but you, they can't help. When it comes to demand, yeah. uh, you, you, you have mentioned several times managing demand. Yeah. I'm a little bit confused as to what you mean by that. Uh, the shipment size is uh, like the demand, the, the, the vehicle kilometer is a demand, the tones are the, the demand, the number of vehicle trips are the demand. You can measure it all with all this. Okay, because yeah. no, I, I'm going to explain. Because uh, to me, if you'd say manage demand immediately, I fall back to pricing or incentivizing or not demand at the customer end. Yeah. So, because this is all driven by request. And one of the points there was e commerce. Yeah. So, an e commerce has proven to be quite challenging for the logistics networks and freight. Yeah. Okay, and it has created a whole mess, each, uh, demands from the customers, same day delivery. Yeah. And then there is the other uh, problem that is quite interesting, and it's this returns. Yeah. And then you can actually order something online, and then you say, I have the shoes, then I order several sizes, and yeah. I just return the ones yeah. that I don't want. And then, then all these are creating issues that, that translate to freight. Yes. Okay? Yeah. So when you talk to me about Managing demand immediately for me is either I put pricing, and you mentioned something in your conclusions, you have thoughts. And then that translates to the customer, and the customer will have to think twice, like how many. So is that what you mean when you talk about managing demand, or, or is something different, as you were saying, like the size of the, the, the shipments or the size of the trucks? Because to me, that doesn't seem that you, if, if you, if you don't make the customer feel the pain, <laughs> you will not have any impact on, on, on how many things you have to deliver. And then you will have to deliver anyway. And then that's what I want to understand. Uh, it's a very interesting point uh, uh, to explain. Uh, for me, the, the technologies, yeah, I, I try to repeat, uh, but it, it, it induces, as you say, it induces more problems, you know, when you bring uh, e-commerce in, it induces, you know, the pressure of delivering uh, the same day, you know, the chaos and the traffic and, and everything, the returns also. I think 35% of the, the goods ordered are returned. So you can see the pressure, like, uh, yeah, the, the, the consumer doesn't use it, but it creates problem in the traffic, you know. The end is not met, but still the induces more problems to the traffic. When I say demand management is basically, uh, I can maybe wrap it in a single word, it's hard uh, to wrap it in a single word, but collaboration or coordination can be a good word to refer to managing demand. Creating collaboration, you know, as, you, as you mentioned, collaboration between carriers, collaboration between shippers, uh, receiver late uh, consolidation programs. Uh, this is how wh what I refer basically again in that game. So, so if I'm understanding correctly, what, what you mean is you're not aiming to the customers to behave, <laughs> but I mean the customers continue to behave in whatever the way they they want, then I, I will ensure that they will receive uh, the goods. Uh, no, not really. Not really. Uh, so it's a, it's a business decision. So uh, if you have a customer, then I mean, from the perspective of the city, 
it's hard to punish the the, the, the consumer, you know. <laughs> so you like, it. yeah. So it should go through the businesses. So you 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 push the businesses to do change. You know, you penalize them, uh, you incentivize good behaviors and everything, and they go the, uh, around and they, they punish the, 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 the consumer for bad behaviors as well. If you punish the businesses for not following a good behavior, then they will go. It will go. Further. The cost will go down eventually to the last consumer. So that's how you shape the chains. Uh, that's how. Uh, that's it. So I have a <clears throat> similar question about technology. Uh, so e-commerce, what you say is creating new kinds of challenges. Yeah. And uh, but I would also see it in a different way for a modeler. It's also creating new ways of opportunities for data yeah. generation. Have you thought about how this new forms of data can be explored uh, to actually get to a better policy intervention? Uh, yeah, for, for my study, basically, I, I focus more on the B2B part. So uh, now I'm shifting it to the territory of B2C. So it's uh, yeah, you you get more data. That's the, the the last mile is a difficult part to manage, and it's usually also expensive. It's good if you can get data to deal with the problem, but uh, yeah, still the <clears throat> it induces more 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 and more every day. So uh, even in B two B data, there could be different things yeah. in a in an environment. Where trust and governance is <coughs> problem, yeah. you have uh, still there is some kind of policy making around reports and reporting. One could even explore that as new forms of data in order to induce into the model to understand better and come to better outcomes. So, like opinion mining of yeah. certain types, yeah. or you could use this uh, automated mining. Yeah. Do you think that could work in the context of uh, Addis? Uh, yeah, I mean now uh, for for the case of Addis, it's it's only now the the e-commerce and these advancements are like happening very slowly. So uh, for sure, uh, then the other is also the the structuring the location of the city because like every street doesn't have a tag and and everything that you can. Uh, really follow. Uh, so yeah, in, in the future, when the, the 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 businesses the businesses are always ahead. So you catch up with getting the data, doing the model, and make some uh, have some insights and in, to deal with the problem. And yeah, that that can follow as well. Yeah, it's, it's possible. And then I had a not a related question, but I. Somehow, when I was listening to your presentation and also when I read through the, I, I feel there is some kind of an inherent opposition or bias that uh, policy making is against trucks and that is the only intervention and against the trucking industry uh, getting into the city. And, uh, and I wonder if this is sort of, you know, and then, of course, you said that after three months they blink their eye, and and I'm just wondering if this has somehow, uh, in any way, come into. Is this really? A, have you, do you have anything to check these claims uh, when it's a general trust problem, both from from both sides, uh, yeah. uh, from the actors to the other stakeholders, and stakeholders to the actors? Uh, could this somehow come into the? implementation of your model in some ways? Uh, for specific to the track uh, restrictions and yeah, uh, the impact, you, uh, you see uh, the problem with the cities, like the traffic jam is, uh, is building up, like uh, from year to year, it, it shows uh, uh, increases. And that's, that's also the worry for, for everyone and also the safety issue. Is the biggest deal. Mm -hmm. the, the city is like the highest rate in, uh, in fatal accident and also accident occurrence at the same time. So uh, if you are a city resident, so you don't see a truck as a, as a vehicle, you know, it's 
you don't see, we, we are also discussing with Lolly in one instance that we mentioned. If you are uh, with your child on the street and you don't see the truck the same way as in the, in the models with the passenger car equivalent, you know, 2.5 passenger car equivalent to the passenger car, like uh, when you uh, interpret it in, in the, in, over the network. But as a resident, you don't see that. You, you see uh, maybe uh, 12 or 15 vehicles coming all together in, in one side. So uh, the city authority captures the perspective of the residents on the business, basically. That's why the trust is broken. So the city authority thinks that they represent the residents, not the business. But the business is really also important. So they should be at least in the, in the middle ground and uh, come up with a compromising solution for everyone. That's, that's my, my, my question. And a related uh, question is, is about this trust again uh, in, in the developing country context. Informal economy and institution plays a huge role, and I wonder how much you explore through your thesis because uh, this is a huge role that plays in terms of the policy intervention. Uh, which way should we take in the end? Uh, and do you do these things matter in Addis? Or yeah, we tried uh, the informalities. Uh, I don't know if I correctly remember the number twenty. 27% of the uh, economic uh, activities taking place with the informal actors like, uh, outside of the economy. So the informality in the economy is very high. So it's good. I mean, there are, you see uh, the movements with policies and stuff, how to formalize the informal sector. And you, you see it from the government side, but uh, the problem for, for, for us in bringing it into the uh, modeling is a data. So it's hard to make survey of this informal. <laughs> they are informal basically. So uh, yeah, in some cases they don't have a business license also. So how, how could they give you data? <laughs> so they are not legal uh, to do business, but they are doing business. Uh, they so these models have only limited functionality? To the mainly to the formal sector, basically. But uh, yeah, we, it's, an ex, uh, an, uh, it's not an uh, explored area, in, even in the modern trade modeling, to include informality of the economic sectors. Uh, yeah, I wish in the future we, we manage that. I have many other questions which I could ask, but I think it's enough. <laughs> from my side, I can maybe ask additional questions after the defense. So thank you very much okay, from okay, my side. Thank you. So I'm, I'm almost all done also with uh, I, I wanted to ask, I, I, when I was reading the thesis, I, I really appreciate the models because they are kind of, kind of models I've seen in statistics and uh, the discussions about uh, uh, stationarity or stereoscedicity, yeah. a word that I can yeah. never say, <laughs> and so on and so forth. And then I, I like it because in this age, uh, or day and age, uh, we have everyone jumping into AI models, yeah. machine yeah. learning. And, and then immediately they see data and then, well, I need a neural network or yeah. a forest, a random forest or nevertheless, do you see any role of these models in your future? I mean, you have the future directions, you want to explore uh, some other things like collaboration, for example, or yeah. inclusion of transferability. And then there are these yeah. issues that, yeah. for example, you have some sensor data that you, you don't see and yeah. so on. Is there any role do you think you will look at that in the future, or that's definitely out of, of the question? And uh, no, I, I, as I said, I'm also into tech. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if you notice in, in the third paper, I use also a machine learning uh, uh, algorithm to cross validate the model. Uh, so, 
it is important, you know, uh, to create uh, scenarios and instances that, that cannot yeah. be captured by the statistical model. So, uh, yeah, and also still the statistical models, uh, the, 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 yeah, they, they are good to explain some things. So if they, we can uh, use the capabilities uh, in uh, analyzing uh, data in an advanced way. Uh, yeah, in, if you have like larger data sets, then it's good to uh, use more advanced ways of uh, uh, modeling it and, and use also the statistical analysis uh, and, and the methods and the models to, uh, yeah, it's like complementing one over the other is a good way for me, I think. And I, and, and I really appreciate because I think it's, it's smart to actually make a, a choice, not just simply jump into what yeah. everyone is doing, but to yeah. actually take the time, look at what is the appropriate thing, what is the capability of what we have. And, yeah. But then, uh, nevertheless, you have other choices. And yeah. I really appreciate that. When the, with that, I, I guess I, Maya said I could ask many more questions, but I think it has been enough. Thank yeah. you very much uh, from my side, I think. I learned quite Thank a lot, you. and, and that's, that's good. And uh, I think I close my questions yeah. for now. Thank you, I appreciate it. So I, even I don't have any more questions. <laughs> uh, I think uh, the time is also 12, and uh, I think we should let you go. Uh, <laughs> if possible, yeah. I think. Yeah. I'm, I'm open. <laughs> but we can talk uh, perhaps in another yeah. forum. Uh, yeah. Thank you for your Defense and uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So well, thank you very much. And uh, I think we also should give the opportunity to um, Bosona as a reserve. If you have any questions. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Avil. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you also for the invitation. Uh, I really appreciate uh, your work. Basically, your work. Uh, is uh, focusing in uh, knowledge transfer from developed uh, countries to developing countries. So in this regard, there is a lack of data and the lack of uh, the fluid system modeling in the home and uh, the analysis models, uh, even the improved ones. So these, uh, in, in general, I think, indicated there uh, your contribution is uh, uh, very important in this regard. Uh, uh, so, yeah, relating to this one, I want to just ask you, uh, you have uh, data during the three years, yeah. 15, 17, and uh, yes, 19. But uh, I was thinking, uh, I mean, uh, when was the duration of the data collection? The season. The season, uh, yes, uh, for example, maybe three days in one uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. cave. And, uh, yeah. It, it, each data collection was continuous uh, process, I think. Yeah, it's, it's a continuous. So was that during the same months, for yeah. example? Of the three? Uh, yeah, basically, the, uh, we, we did the surveys around this time. Basically, we are in uh, like May, June. So mm -hmm. that's where all the, all the threes uh, are made. But the establishment surveys, they took more time. Uh, they don't respond right away. So maybe if you go to the establishment, then they will tell you uh, the responsible person who knows the, the, the response for your survey will be available on this date. So you should go uh, on that specific day to get the data. So, yeah, but it, it, the, the coordinate surveys uh, and the tra classified traffic counts, they took three, five days. Uh, yeah. But uh, the establishment survey took much longer time, like one month or one and a half month in some of the, the, the sectors. Yeah, because the time trend indicated the <coughs> decreasing shipment yeah. size, as you say. So that maybe there is one of the reasons could be 
Rasiz Mahzari. And again, in your modeling, you consider the temporal yeah. uh, aspect. Maybe there could be the seasonal variation, and so you can model and investigate from that. Because in the Ethiopian context, for example, if you measure the free flow during the end of August, during yeah. the Holiday New time. Year, yeah. yes, uh, activity in the, in, in the January, for example, it could be uh, different. Yeah. So that, that kind of uh, aspect could be there. So the other question, maybe. Yeah, in, in relation to shipment size, you have used different words, maybe, I don't know if you have been using the interchangeable, I want to understand that, the payload, observed payload, and the shipment size. What really the difference to all this? Is yeah. the same word is used? Uh, basically, uh, <coughs> we are referring to the same thing, but, uh, uh, the, di the difference is the, the, the shipment size is an indicator of the, the payload. So the shipment size is a latent variable even in, in, in the model. Mm -hmm. So in the, in the model, if you put the payload, then there will be like 100% correlation with the vehicle type. So in order to break that correlation, then you have the shipment size. So, so the shipment size in this case, uh, I mean, in the presentation, you, you use tons for both. Tons, yeah. 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 They are the same. But uh, the, the, why we introduce shipment size is, is, is an estimator of the payload. Because if you use the payload, then the payload and the truck type are like, uh, yeah, uh, there is endogenity problem mm -hmm. uh, for that. They, they are directly correlated. So, in order to break that correlation, we introduce shipment size in the model, then you can estimate yeah, and the with a latent variable. We use the shipment size yeah. with uh, the measure of uh, also not only the, the weight, but also the frequency. Yeah, it can it can also be in the economic order quantity, then yeah. it has more meanings uh, than, than a payload. But in here, with our models, we capture the OD flows, the, the, the OD flows between uh, the different sectors, so we intercept the flow. So in that case, uh, yeah, we capture the, the, the payloads, but we estimated the shipping size. And they, they require more or less the same thing. In the, in the transshipment point is... For the uh, impact analysis. <coughs> yeah, have you, have you located them at Pali or which, which uh, specific yeah. positions are you using? Uh, we have five gates to the city, so we locate the transshipment stations uh, at the gates of the city. Of the gate, okay, so it's the same. Yeah, it's more practical also. To put yeah, from actions. practical point of view, so the, for example, the transshipment, that may involve a kind of a uh, lot of logistics activity for cost. Is yeah. Have you considered that one? Or? Uh, we consider the, uh, the transshipment as a cross docking facility, no yes. storage or inventory, but uh, we have handling costs there. We consider yeah. in the logistic cost, we have the handling cost also included together with the transport cost. Yeah, this is the last one. Uh, because I must have used this one, you mentioned you have used the um, uh, if the uh, port to the port and from the port activity have been included in the interviews or something like yeah. that. By the way, which, which port are you referring to? Uh, I'm referring to the Hinterland port, port, the dry the port. Main, so, yeah, the, the dry port, uh, mainly the dry ports. Uh, mm -hmm. We have lots of dry ports within the, the Hinterland ports. Uh, we are referring to them. Yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Persona. So now I'm turning to the audience to see if there are any questions. I'm also looking at Agnes down in the corner. Are there any? No, any? No questions from the uh, from the webinar. Any questions here in the room? Thank you.
you very much. Uh, thank you. It's not a question, but it's just like, I'm not sure, but uh, we heard about collaboration and digitalization. So I'm just wondering, like, you know, would you advocate when you go back home uh, to, for the advancement of digitalization, <coughs> like, you know, to have a good network of transportation? Because you mentioned some trucks going back at the delivery, yeah. empty, empty, so that, you know, they can collaborate, so that, you know, when they go, they can work together, so the other ones on their way back can pick up something. Yeah. So that you know the cost will be lower. Yeah. So I'm just asking. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a it's a good uh, uh, it's a, it's a good thing. Uh, <clears throat> the MPT return is uh, significant, uh, which is 42 uh, percent with our surveys. Uh, it's good to uh, yeah make uh, collaboration, but uh, in order to lower this, uh, there are also other other things that, that should be considered. For example, uh, yeah, if you have a, 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 yeah, if you have a petroleum truck, then you cannot send uh, milk on its way back. So there are also commodity behaviors that uh, should be considered. Yeah, but still collaboration and integration within the system can, can really uh, help to lower this uh, rate. <coughs> Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Abel. Uh, uh, very interesting to follow, and I can't say that I really understood everything. Um, but I, it's really counterintuitive this that the large trucks have lower emissions and everything. Um, and I'm just wondering, um, and that they lead to less congestion, congestion, because I think you said that it does. Yeah. Uh, could you just like, did you take that into account, the the congestion and what they would lead to, and these alternative routes? Yeah. Did you model the congestion also? Uh, yeah, the, the thing is when, I, when we discuss about the, the implementation of the, the trucks on the routes, we optimize the movement with uh, uh, optimized assignment, like equilibrium assignment, equilibrium within, within the model, uh, within the road network, like the whole area. So uh, the, 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 the assignment is based on like... Uh, uh, travel time impedance, which is like the, they only took the shortest uh, travel time routes within the, the traffic. So it's an optimized environment. Okay, uh, so it's not in actual traffic with all It's the... an actual. Oh, it is an actual. Yeah, okay. yeah. It's, it's along with all okay. the vehicle traffic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and then I just wanted to ask also, because you say that, uh, I mean, now you use the current means of alternative transportation with smaller uh, vehicles, yeah. but that it could be improved, then you could consider electric cars or yeah. electric vehicles or even cargo bikes. Yeah. Is that realistic in the current, uh, in Addis today? Would that be feasible? Uh, for the bikes, I'm uh, uh, skeptical uh, because the terrain also is, uh, should be into consideration because Addis is small gradient, so uh, that can be a problem for the bikes, but the electric vehicles. Uh, it's, <laughs> It, it, it works, and uh, that's why I left it open, you know, for optimization and for the innovation. So the innovation can be introducing new uh, vehicle types, like electric vehicles. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for an excellent presentation. Really interesting to listen to. Uh, I was wondering, uh, you said that some of these changes was a bit easier to implement, and some were more institutional. Uh, would, did you find anything that was lo like low-hanging fruit in general in developing economies? Like the first thing they should do is generally this, or is everything a case-by-case -case basis depending on the city and country in question? Yeah, uh, it depends on your uh, who are you referring to, the city authority or the business uh, sectors. Uh, From your modeling standpoint. Yeah, from the city authority, then, yeah, uh, as I said, the uh, collaboration is a low hanging. Uh, you have MT tracks and uh, so many problems, so creating collaboration can be uh, a good way to, to start with uh, and also build trust as well in, in the collaboration. Uh, from the perspective of the business uh, actors, I think they know more. <laughs> 
they know more what they know what they are doing. Even uh, I have a feeling that when they when you saw them, they they do something really that doesn't make sense for you. Then yeah, I I recommend uh, you know to ask them more. They they will tell you they have a good reason to do it. You know, so uh, I I I don't advise them, but I advise them to act nice. <laughs> Yeah, but they know that they are doing, what they are doing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Another question now there? So. Avril, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I'm happy for this nice presentation. So. Coming to this point is, uh, I think it is not easy. Uh, there was a lot of up and downs. So what was your, the challenge you have been through and uh, what is your advice for young PhD candidates? Thank you very much. I, I, it's hard for me to make advice. <laughs> uh, still, I'm not finished yet. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there are a lot of challenges in the, in the PhD. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I can give you a list. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Any final question? No. I think we are coming to the end of this session. And uh, but before that, I would like to inform that the. Uh, Evaluation committee will have a close meeting afterwards on the fifth floor. I think that Girma can get, guide you the way up there. Uh, and I also then finally like to thank you all here for this day, and especially you, Abel, for your performance, the opponent for uh, all the interesting discussion, and also, of course, the evaluation committee for the following up questions and, and, and further discussions. So with that said, thank you very much. This session is closed.